All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live, and this is going to be a roast fest where the Jew will be roasting me, the Kittim, or if you will, the Goyim. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Myth Vision. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Rabbi, thank you for joining me. Thank you. I, let me explain to you why Derek is a little spun out. We had a little talk before we went on air. Yeah, we did. And I don't want to give away too much, but I'll just say this, because there is a a rabbi congregant relation between Derek and I. And there is a certain, um, you know, there, there are certain ethical elements, but Derek hasn't shown up in synagogue for three weekends in a row, three Sabbaths missed, gone, wasn't there. Yeah. And it's an issue and we need to talk about it. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think you were going to mention that uh, to everybody. I, I, th I no, I, so I, my sense was, and I wanted to reassure you that, because I think you feel that if you showed up in synagogue with your prayer shawl on, yeah. that that would somehow affect your myth vision gig. <laughs> and I wanted to tell you that I, I, I really won't. It really won't. It'll be good. You can do that. You just come in with a prayer shawl. We put a yarmulke on you. You message me that you were circumcised. You're all set. You're ready to go. Yeah. And yeah, so that's the only thing. Yeah. So he well, has not been to synagogue. I will speak to the queen, send her a message. Yeah. You convey that to her. I will. I'll let her know that you just embarrassed me in front of everybody on the channel. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's my uh, pleasure. That's <laughs> my field. That's what I'm here <laughs> Seriously, thank you for joining. And I figure I'd ask with point blank question out the gate. Right. Anyone who has questions, feel free to super chat them. Um, I'm hanging out here with Rabbi Tovia Singer. And if you want to steer the conversation by having a question, of course, I ask that you be polite. If it is a rude, condescending, arrogant, derogatory, something like that, uh, I just won't address the question. So please keep that. If, if, it's real, if, it's a, if the question is of a religious nature, this is not the appropriate place or time. I'm kidding. Let's continue. Go ahead. I, <laughs> sorry. If these jokes are too advanced, I can dial the whole thing down. They're definitely. No yeah. You're giving yeah, us they, too much. Uh, it, I think you should tone it down. A yeah, we should. Yeah. Yeah. You're going hard. On it. Let's save right. some of the heavy stuff for later during the interview because yeah. you can't give it all up front. You know, um, no. Rabbi, why do Jews reject Jesus? And I mean, looking at it historically, why didn't they just out the gate recognize, dude, this is the Messiah. This is, the promised one. This is this is our Messiah. Why don't they accept it? What's the problem with uh I guess I could use the term. What's the problem with the Jews, man? What as Christians will say, they're hard-hearted, they don't see the truth, they don't have spiritual eyes, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is the truth from a Jewish side? Yeah, so the the answer is that it's the Bible, it's passages soaring messianic passages in the Jewish scriptures, and nothing that Jesus did bears any resemblance to what the Hebrew prophet said the Messiah is supposed to accomplish. It's really that simple. You know, the Jewish people would have loved to have a Messiah during the first century. For those who don't know, it's not like in our time we can get on a plane in 11 hours, be there, and the nice, friendly people. That was during the Roman Empire. We were under the heel of the empire. We would have loved a Messiah. The problem was that what he came, what he did, we are told by the church, uh, bears no resemblance to anything that we find in the Jewish scriptures. Let, let's, let's take a look at a messianic passage that's so famous that even the United Nations, I'm not a fan, had the brains to put it on the wall of the UN on 42nd Street and 1st Avenue, northeast corner, is the Isaiah Wall. This is the United Nations. So you imagine you want to come up with something fairly uncontroversial. The book of Isaiah is considered holy by about one out of two people on this planet. Okay? All right? So we're not, I'm not going far afield. I'm not reaching. I'm not, there's not an inference. In the, in the, in the end of days, this is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Really simple, okay? The Lord, his temple be raised above all mountains, above the hills. And all the nations will stream to it. Next verse, verse 3. 
people will say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, the temple of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his way so that we may walk in his paths. In verse 4, in verse 4, believe it or not, we have six words that tell us about the Messiah himself. Six words in Hebrew. He will judge between the nations, and he will rebuke many people. That's it. No dying for anybody's sins. No resurrection from the dead. No dying on a cross. No lamb talk. None of this stuff. And what will they do? The world will do this. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. Okay? Uh, the, the, these are the most numinous, ecstatic messianic prophecies in all of the Hebrew Bible. It's actually mentioned in two places. It's mentioned here in Isaiah 2 and almost a verbatim in Micah chapter 4. Okay. It made it to the United Nations. The United Nations can agree that's an appropriate text. And it says this is what will happen in the end of days. That means there are texts that are controversial. This is not one of them. Now listen very carefully. Does, did anything Jesus do, did anything in the first century occur that remotely resembles this? Nothing. Was there peace during the first century? Did the nations take their implements of war and transform them into implements of agriculture? Did that occur? No, it's just the opposite. The first century was riddled with war between the Jews and the Romans, between the Romans and, and other groups. There wasn't a temple built. There was a temple destroyed. It bears no resemblance to that. Now, here we're going to go, here's where we go nuclear, okay? You are not ready for what you're about to hear. This passage that is so famous, in how many, there are 27 books in the Christian Bible, 27 books in the Christian canon. Of those 27 books, in how many of them is this, are, is this passage quoted? Just think. This is, um, un, th there's no controversy. These are messianic passages. Um, without doubt, the most famous. In, of the 27 books in the Christian Bible, of the 89 chapters in the Gospels, how many times, I mean, after all, we are told that the Christian Bible is there to tell us about what? The Messiah. I mean, could, am I like setting up a straw man and toppling it? Listen very carefully. I don't know if you've ever heard this before. So I know Paul, as you said, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, seeks to characterize the Jews as blind scales, veils, and schmales over our eyes. As it turns out, my friends, Isaiah chapter 2 is never quoted in the New Testament. What? You heard me right. Isaiah chapter 2 is never quoted. How is it possible that the most important verses in the entire Jewish Bible, arguably, that are messianic, appear nowhere, appear nowhere in a book that purports to tell us about the Messiah? Nothing more important than that. Does not not if you're a Christian listening to my voice right now, does that not raise some curiosity that passages in contrast that bear no resemblance to the Messiah, like King David writing, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That means there's nothing in Psalm 22 that says this is going to happen in the future. The Messiah is not mentioned in Psalm 22. And I'm thinking of a really famous passage. I'm not, I'm stealing man, I'm steel manning this. How is it possible that a passage that's written in the first person, King David speaks, the author, whoever wrote Psalm 22, is speaking, first person, and he's crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That passage is selected with the trackball white letters on a blue background, and then pasted into the mouth of Jesus' dying words on the cross. 
you find in the book of Mark, the cry of dereliction, that makes it. And there's nothing in that chapter that tells you he's talking about the Messiah. In fact, quite the contrary. It's all in the first person, and it's written in the past tense. Like, why did you forsake me? Not like, why are you going to forsake me in a thousand years from now? A little footnote here. Jesus lived about a thousand years after King David. I mean, and then people think the Jews are blind. The people think, like, the Jews are just reckless rejectionists. We have the seed of the devil, John 8, 44. There's a demon in us. We're blind. We, God has, prov has brought salvation to the Gentiles to provoke jealousy among the Jews. Really? Really? Don't you think there's something more likely going on here? That the, the core messianic passages in the Bible that are not controversial— Okay? So I'm not going to passages which are contra. I'm taking, like, let's just take the Isaiah 11. Predators will lie together with their prey side by side. Children will be able to play in a den where there are poisonous snakes. Figuratively conveying powerfully in, in a way that only Isaiah could that there will be peace among people where formerly there was not peace. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. Please look it up in your King James Bible. It doesn't make a difference who translated this. And then you come to the Jews and say, and I'm not saying you, I'm saying Paul does this, you know. Even as they me. have. Don't blame not me. You. I blame you a little bit, not so <laughs> much. But, and then Paul says, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets, contrary to all mankind, forbidding us to preach to the Gentiles. You know what there's, that's from? That's 1 Thessalonians. You know what that means, 1 Thessalonians? That means that's the oldest surviving literature ever written about Christianity. That's the oldest Christian book that survives. There are probably books that are older, but that's the oldest. 1 Thessalonians, we could date that to 49 or 50. That's really early. And the Jews, bingo. Really? Maybe the, the core teachings of the church are opposed by the Hebrew Bible? I rest my case. Okay, Rabbi, we have a bunch of super chats. Thank you, everybody, in the chat. Um, I seriously appreciate your answer. You know, it's fun to see how uh, these people were, like, lifting all of this stuff. So I'm going to get people's questions, focus on that, ask you, and uh, – Keep in mind, we have like five or six of them already. I uh, just want to try and get through them. So the first one is by our enemy, our common enemy. His name is Nil. He has a YouTube channel called Gnostic Informant. I mean, he's our friend. I'm sorry. He's our friend. Uh, he's a good guy. We actually just <laughs> did a great, great show together. Yeah. I was teasing. Yeah, Nil's a good guy. He just interviewed with you. I don't know when that's going to launch. I'm looking forward to it. That'll be fun. It's a very good interview. He did a very good job. Yeah, he's, he's we did amazing stuff with him. He's an amazing uh, goyim. Uh, that's that's all I could say. Well, he's not going to be a goyim for long. I'm when I'm there, <laughs> that's temporary. He said, "So you're saying that I can't sacrifice children and be forgiven for sins?" Shucks, that's yeah. his statement. Thank you for the super chat. <laughs> the nice. next one is Doc Pleromanot. He says, uh, "The Epistle of Barnabas goes out of its way to view Jewish law as non-literal." How did this anti-Jew polemic find its way out of orthodox hermeneutics? How did it find its way out of it? Yeah, because it, it was, all right. So here, all right. So let's get a background. So the Epistle of Barnabas is a is a a, a pseudepigrapha. So Barnabas didn't write it, but it's pretty early. Don't confuse that with the Gospel of Barnabas. That's actually wasn't written that long ago. Forget that book. So the Epistle of Barnabas is, did not make it into canon for many, many reasons. There, there were uh, what, what might be called proto-Orthodox thinkers who thought that it had some a tinge of Gnosticism or lack of Orthodoxy. But in a sense, what the Gospel of Barnabas, what the excuse me, the Epistle of Barnabas did was it, it sort of just amped up Pauline ideas. So Paul is conveying that the Jews never got it, and the law, it was never about the law. The Epistle of Barnabas goes beyond Paul. So let me just 
go through an, one element of Pauline theology that shows up all over the place. When I say all over, I don't mean just the letters in the New Testament that are attributed to Paul, 13, are attributed to him, but also in, in the Pauline letters, like the book of Hebrews, a, a letter that Christians for a very long time thought was authored by Paul. In fact, that's how it made it into the canon. I want to take Colossians 2, Colossians 2, 16, 17. Let no one tell you about what you should eat, what you're drinking, your holidays, keeping the Sabbath, your new moons. Let no one tell you about keeping those things. You know why? Because the law is only a shadow. The essence is Christ. That's, that's pulling. You'll find the same language in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. I mean, Hebrews was not written by Paul, but I assure you, Paul would have given him an A+. Plus. Okay. Now, what the epistle of Barnabas does, it, it amps it up more, and that is, it's not that you don't have to keep the law. See, Paul's theology is that the law is there as a mirror. It's there as a, a taskmaster, using the la master, using the language of Galatians. The, the role of the law is like a, a, a task that you, you look in the mirror. And what do you see when you look in the mirror? You see that your face is dirty. You see, and then you wash it, and that's the Holy Spirit. So the point of the law is to chasten you into a relationship with Christ. So it wasn't the essence, it's only the shadow, which isn't the essence. The epistle of Barnabas is heretical in a sense because it goes much further than that. It, the epistle of Barnabas argues, as an example, that it's not just you're not supposed to, that the law forbidding you of what you can eat, I'm using specific Colossians 2, 16, 17, is not because it, the reason why you can eat pork is not because it, the whole ritual uh, commandment is only a shadow. No, no, no. The Jews never understood it to begin with. That means it was never about the prohibition of eating pork. Leviticus 11 didn't care about the prohibition of eating pork. Rather, it was trying to teach you how not to behave like a pig. So you see, that's not what Paul taught. So it was these kinds of ideas. It's highly amped up, and we certainly could say, I can understand how the author, who, we don't know who wrote it, but whoever wrote the Epistle of Barnabas would come to that conclusion, just how we can understand how Augustine could come to the conclusions he does in his writings centuries later. And we can understand how the doctrine of the Trinity would emerge centuries after New Testament was concluded, because we could see the amped up Christology in the prologue of John. But that's why the Epistle of Barnabas is was long known to have not been written by, well, not been written by opponents, but it wasn't orthodox, even by uh, church fathers. Thank you so much, Rabbi. I appreciate the answer. Uh, can I one, one, just one, I just add one thing. I just want to add one point. Uh, yeah. This 30 seconds. There are many books that did not make it into the canon, but had an enormous influence on Christian thinking. That's all. And the proto, the proto gospel of James didn't make it in, but boy, did that have an enormous impact on the way Christians thought about Mary the Immaculate Conception. That's where it comes from. So uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, although it doesn't make it into the canon, and there's so many books like this, it has an enormous impact on the way Christians thought. It shaped their thinking. Go ahead. No, thank you, thank you. Uh, Festering Balls, thank you so much for the super chat. They said, some apologists claim that there was more than one day of prep preparation for Passover Therefore, there's no contradiction with the day Jesus died in John. Any truth there, Rabbi? No, <laughs> no, no. There was more than one preparation day? No, no, no. All right, here, this is where this all comes from. Okay. The Synoptic Gospels, Jesus crucified on the first day of Passover. And the Last Supper, which for those of you who are, have never been Christians, the Last Supper occurs the night before his crucifixion, okay? So if he has any Christian, the Last Supper, what was it really? If he, he, Most Jews would know this. People who just have any, if a superficial, perfunctory knowledge of religion would know, the Last Supper was a, a Passover Seder. And that's quite the case for the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus is the, uh, 
has the Last Supper, and that's where you find the Eucharist, right? You find it in exactly you would expect to find it, the Eucharist. Like, take this bread and eat it in my body for you in Luke 22 and Mark 14 and in Matthew 27. I mean, that's where you expect to find it. You expect to find the Eucharist right there. It all is good, right? Good. Okay. Big problem. Big problem is that this is not the way John thought. The book of John in the Gospels alone advanced the idea that Jesus was the Lamb of God. See John chapter 1, verse 29, chapter 1, verse 29, and verse 36. Behold the Lamb of God. You will find nothing resembling that in the synoptic Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, on what day was were the lambs sacrificed? So you need to understand this. The, the Passover Seder, which is the night, the eve of the of Passover, for Jewish people, the day begins at nightfall. Okay? So in this non-Jewish world, like the next day, like when does the date change on your computer in the lower right hand corner? If you're using Windows, I don't know what people Mac. When does the day change? The day changes at 12 midnight, right? At 12 midnight, the day changes, okay? For the Jews, the day changes when it's nightfall. That's when the night begins. Next day begins. Why? Because the Bible says in Genesis, it was evening, it was morning, one day. So the day in the Bible begins at night. Now, so therefore, in the book of John, John wants Jesus to be the Lamb of God. When were the Lamb slaughtered? On the 14th day of Nisan, which is the day before the First day of Passover, which is the 15th day of Passover. So, therefore, if that's going to happen, then Jesus has to be crucified, not on the first day of Passover, but a day earlier, the preparation day, as you will find in, in the book of John. That is why everything falls into place on this point. For example, where do you find the Last Supper in the book of John? John chapter 13. Right from John 13 all the way through 17, you have the farewell discourse. 13 is your last supper. What don't you have in John 13? Think, think, think. What don't you find in John 13? No Eucharist. There's no take this, my body for you, my drink, the wine, this is for you. It's not there. Why? Because it's not a Passover Seder, according to John. Got it? Passover Seder would be the next day. You got it? Where is John's? Last Supper. Well, excuse me. Where is John's Eucharist? What chapter? Chapter six. Why? What is it doing in chapter six? Because John doesn't have it in his Last Supper. At the Last Supper, Judas is carried. I'm going down to John chapter thirteen, verse twenty-nine. Judas is carried is leaving with a bag of money. We are told in John that the disciples are looking at this curiously. Where is he going with the money? Okay. And they conclude that he's using, he's leaving in order to purchase money, for, purchase food, preparations for the feast meal, which would be the next night. What? you? I thought you are eating the feast meal. How could you go out to buy it when you're eating it? What happens in John's Last Supper in John 13? Is Jesus washing the feet of, of the disciples? And that's why they do all that stuff in a church. See, Christians think it's all all happened. It's not. It's all conflated. It's smushed together. It, the, the, in John's gospel, and only John's gospel, the Jewish leaders, when arguing for Jesus' crucifixion and going back and forth, as it's leading up to his, this is the day you know, the day of his crucifixion, they refused to enter into Pontius Pilate's praetorium because they did not want to become defiled. This can only be found in John. I have to understand this. I need to know this. I need you to know this well. You can't uh, eat the Passover lamb in a state of impurity, and non-Jews would bury dead people in their homes. If you're wealthy or not, they would, your grandpa was in the living room. Non-Jewish homes are just a place of where anything could be defiled. You can say, and Pontius Pilate was all right. So the Jews 
would before before they would eat the Passover lamb, they had to be very, very careful not to be become contaminated. In fact, the Torah provides for the possibility that someone is is become contaminated on the 15th day of Nisan. Let's say someone just died and you had to do a funeral. So there's actually a second Passover opportunity a month later. So this is, but this only comes up in the book of John. Why? Because in the book of John, if you're if it's Friday, they both have it on Friday, but if it's Friday and Jesus is being crucified, that means you didn't eat the Passover lamb yet, because in John's gospel, the Passover lamb would have been eaten Friday night rather than one thin Thursday night. So it's a Thursday night versus a Friday night. You got it? Like all this, all this, all this, all this comes together. It's a it's complete. Now, what I now I think you, the viewer, can go. Oh, here's a cool contradiction. This is like, and it really is unanswerable. There's no answer to this. You can try there. Now, it's not they had they don't try. I mean, everyone does, but it, there's just no answer to this. What I'd like you to do is to view this in a scholarly way. So one way, of course, everyone is hit by the this astonishing contradiction. This would have contra this would have consequences in Christian practice. Like when would you practice Easter? In the old days, before the Council of Nicaea, Christians would, would celebrate Easter based on whenever Passover was, and some would do it the 14th, and some would do it the 15th, because some went with John, some went with the synoptics. This was a big issue that was finally solved in at the Council of Nicaea. This is Huge. What I want you to think about, I write about this extensively in, in both in, in Let's Get Biblical. I want you to think about this is how stories in the New Testament were written. This, I believe, is more valuable. Rather than, well, here's a contradiction. That's not what's important. What's valuable is now we know how the New Testament was written. What John had was a theological view that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And actually, the lamb of the lamb in Exodus twelve was not in a sacrifice for sin. Christians don't know that, but he then created, shaped, massaged data, manufactured a history around a theology. That's how these stories are created. That's what I think is the most valuable thing. Is this is like so insightful? One other point, a footnote, but I think it's important. John did not invent the notion that Jesus was the lamb or the Passover lamb. Strangely, although it's not in the synoptics, the three earlier gospels chronologically, it is, it does, that idea does appear in the letters of Paul, specifically 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and so on. So, so that idea was out there. John, the Joannian community picks it up, and whoever writes the book of John includes it. But I, the healthy way to examine this literature is get past this as a crazy contradiction and go, wow, so this is how the New Testament invented stories. They had an idea and then created a story around the idea. But no, there's no second Passover. This is just a flat contradiction. Christian scholars know this. Awesome. Rabbi, we have another one by Courageous, and uh, I hope I'm saying that that correctly. What about the Messiah of Joseph? Now, they corrected this, so I'm going to try and correct it for him whenever I explain this. What about the Messiah of Joseph? I didn't know there are two Messiahs in the Old Testament, is what they said, till recently. Could he theoretically be, and I think they mean to say, son of Joseph, not of David? Could they mean that? All right. Good question. Really good. A lot of people ask that question. So let me start off to make this really easy because people are going with Messiah Joseph. Like what? So let me, I might as well just get this off. If you don't want to hear all thing, let me do the, the fast version. The word term Messiah Joseph or Messiah the son of Joseph appears nowhere in the Jewish Bible. That's one. So it's not biblical. The, the term is not biblical, okay? Second point that I think people must know in order to even value this kind of information is that the Messiah, and he's talked about in the Bible quite a bit, is never called the Messiah in Tanakh. In the Hebrew Bible, the Messiah is not called the Messiah. We do that. But in fact, ancient Jewish literature does not. It's not that it never does. It'll do it in the post-biblical period. 
sometimes in the in the you'll have it in Talmudic period for sure, but very frequently our rabbis didn't refer to it that way because in the Bible the word Messiah appears 39 times. And it it's in almost all cases referring to a priest. That's why the word Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah, appears in the book of which one do you think more frequently than any other? If what I told you is correct, well, Pierce in Leviticus talking about Kohanim priests like myself who were anointed. That's what Mashiach, Mashiach is a verb. It means to anoint in people of leadership position, a priest, king, leaders, even a non-Jew, Cyrus, he was anointed, Isaiah 45, verse 1. So we have to be very careful about language, okay? So we got that all done. So in Tanakh, like in Tanakh, we have a term, the Son of God, right? But it doesn't mean anything like what Christians mean it to me. So we have to be very careful because in Abrahamic religions, we are frequently using the same term, but we really mean something quite different, okay? So all it means, all anointed simply means that you're anointed for some um, for some role to carry out God's purpose. And in fact, son of God in the Jewish Bible, again, means you are designated ho and hopefully carrying out the will of God. King Solomon, 2 Samuel 7, 12. It's all over the place. Okay, now, the rabbis tell us about something in the Hebrew Bible, and that's a war. The Jewish scriptures foretell that at the end of days, the Jewish people will return to the land of Israel, and the nations surrounding the Holy Land would not be satisfied with that arrangement. And consequently, you guessed it, they'll go to war with the Jewish state, with the, with the Jews who have returned. Okay, This is described in many, many books in the Hebrew Bible. Very famously, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Um, very famously, Zechariah chapter 8. Very famously, Zechariah chapter 12. Very famously, Zechariah 14. You know where this is all going. Okay. So you need to know this to get anything. The Hebrew Bible tells us thousands of years ago that the Jews are going to be expelled from the land. They're going to be in exile for many, many years. Hosea 3, 4, and 5 as an example. But at some point in the very distant future, the Jews will return to the land of Israel and will have Jerusalem in their hands. And then what happens? Nations. They're, at, they're named. And that's how Ezekiel 38 opens. They're a confederacy of nations called Gug. Gug literally means a roof. People who trust in the roof. And what occurs? Nations go to war against Jerusalem, and it's a very bad idea. It's an ill-advised war, and ultimately those who go to war with the Jewish people will be destroyed. God will – now I'm, I'm deliberately zooming in now to Zoom, like Google Earth. It's, it's Hebrew Bible uh, maps where – Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8, 9, delightful text. God is going to strengthen the Jewish people. The weakest will be like David, even like the angels, okay? And they will defeat their enemies. All the enemies of Israel are going to be defeated. The, the lead nation that goes against Israel is going to be Persia, modern-day Iran. I'm not kidding. See Ezekiel 38. You can't even make this stuff up. It's insane. Now, in that battle against Israel over Jerusalem. Jerusalem is what's mentioned. There's someone who gets killed in battle. The text says in Zechariah 12, 12, verse 10, they will look to me because of the one that was killed, stabbed, pierced through, and they will mourn over him as one mourns over a firstborn son. In the midst of battle, again, context, verse 8 and 9 is the Jews are going to be very strong, shockingly strong. But a person gets killed, a warrior gets killed in that battle, and everyone turns to God, and they just mourn over him. And that triggers the repentance of the Jewish people, and the repentance brings the final machine, the final, the Messiah, the son of David. You got to, you have to know that, or nothing I'm going to tell you makes any sense at all. That person who gets killed in battle is called the Messiah, the son of Joseph, in the Talmud. He's not the Messiah, capital M. He's Messiah, lowercase m. Like, I'm a priest. I'm a direct descendant of Aaron. So I'm a lowercase m Messiah, if I were anointed, which I'm not because I'm not working in the temple. So the key is that in the Talmud, the source for this is, sac is the book of uh, Tractate Sukkah uh, 52b. So that person who gets killed in war 
triggers a lamenting among the Jewish people. It will be very much like what happened in the valley of in in the valley of Megiddo. By the way, that's where Revelation gets their Armageddon from. That's where Revelation comes up with like Armageddon. That all is a misread of the text. I'm not going into Revelation now, but that's where it all comes from. All right. The text is saying it's like what happened in the Valley of Megiddo. That's where Josiah got killed, a king who got killed in the battle with Egypt. So therefore, there are loads and loads of people who are anointed, thousands of them, two eschatological figures in Jewish literature. Again, not in Tanakh, but in the Talmud. The rabbis are honing in on two individuals. One is the actual Messiah of David, the fulfillment, the heir to the promises made to King David in the Davidic Covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. However, the Messiah, son of Joseph, is not the Messiah with a capital in any conventional sense. He is, however, an eschatological figure that will trigger the repentance of the Jewish people. So these are not the Messiah. One last point, because I'd be cheating you if I didn't tell you this. And this ties into what we talked about earlier. You remember, I said to you that John, and John alone, as far as the Gospels are concerned, treats Jesus, characterizes Jesus as the Passover lamb. This is huge, huge thing. John, therefore, is going to shape, create, mold all sorts of stories, plot devices, in order to have Jesus in some figurative way comport, match, fit with Exodus chapter 12, in particular, the Passover lamb story. So John wants to reinforce the idea that Jesus is the Lamb of God. So therefore, there's a story that appears in John that doesn't appear in the Synoptic Gospels. What's the story? Jesus crucified. He's dead already. What happens next? They want to, like, bury his body right away. Okay, They want to bury him right away. Now, the problem is, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with Jerusalem, Jerusalem has really good weather. If you go on, what's the weather in Jerusalem? So right now, it's a little cold because we're dead winter. But Dead winter, it's like only 40, I think it's like 48 degrees, 50 degrees. It's it's a very temperate climate. Jerusalem is just eight months out of the year. It's really nice weather. I mean, that's like gorgeous weather. It's, you couldn't be, you could, if you're a healthy adult, you can last a week on the cross and you're not going to die. So what did soldiers do? What did Rome do if they wanted someone to die quickly? Now, there's... Whatever. What did they do? Like, Because John is having Jesus crucified so late. Like, how do you die on a cross in six hours? So they come to break his legs. Because when you're on a cross, what happens is you didn't die from the actual crucifixion, from being bound to a cross or, all right, let's just say they actually had nails in a cross, that some crucifixions were done that way. It's possible. But the key was that you were left there naked and it took, Days and days and days for someone to die. Eventually, what did you die of? You, it, it wasn't an infection. It was something you got from the nails or something. You you couldn't hold yourself. You couldn't stand anymore. So your legs gave out. Your lungs became elongated, and you died of asphyxiation. Okay, But you could stand for a really long time in Jerusalem because the weather is really nice. This is not, this is not Alaska. So the Romans, we're told in John, this is John 19, 34 through 37, went to break his legs in order so that he couldn't sustain himself and he would die quickly. But they wanted to find out, they wanted to test if, in fact, he was dead. And, they, and a Roman soldier took a spear and pierced his side. Forthwith came blood and water. And those that saw it knew that it was true. And this is the fill too, and therefore, he didn't have to break his leg because they knew he was already dead. So this is not even the crucifixion. This is mind-blowing. And then John tells us this is to fulfill two passages. One, that not a bone of him should be broken. And second, I don't think I ever shared this on, on your show before. And the other passage, look at verse 37, says, and they, quoting Zechariah 12.10, and they shall look upon him whom they pierced. But look back at Zechariah 12.10 and use your King James, use your NIV. Just go side by side and you will see that John flipped the pronoun. In a King James, NIV, I don't care what Christian Bible you use, go to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. It's going to read, they will look to me probably whom they pierced. But I want to go look to me, okay? That's first person pronoun. 
singular. Now, just compare Zechariah 12, 10 to John chapter 19, 37. Just do them side by side. In John 19, 37, he changes the pronoun because it doesn't work. And it says there, and they will look, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. It's not even a crucifixion, it's a post-mortem inspection. How do you change the Bible? How do you forget and misappropriate the text? It has nothing to do with the final war. How do you play with the pronoun? And if you're going to change me to him in order to advance a, a theology of a Joannian theology, you think I'm going to get baptized? You think I'm going to church? I'm going to go to church? Why would you want to be involved? Why wouldn't you have anything to do with a criminal enterprise like the church, like the New Testament? This is what John did, how he changed. So great question. And now you got the whole picture. Rabbi, um, you're kind of showing me up here, and we talked about this. You're really not supposed to be making me look stupid on my own show. You know what I mean? Well, I, I, I know. It's not easy. You're not making this easy. So help me I, out. You know, this I is know. a partnership. You know, if you could... This you know, is not, I can't carry the show myself, okay? You kind of so, are right now. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's, I know, it's, so. it's embarrassing. But all right, we'll get to the next right. question. We're going to have to right. talk about this later. This is just right. over the well, top. I'm putting my phone on mute after the show's over. Go ahead. <laughs> Doc Pleroma, thank you. I'm pulling you. out the battery on my Samsung. Go ahead. <laughs> Doc Pleroma, not thanks for the super chat. Uh, the Justin and Trifo spat uh, clearly shows that Isaiah 714 was non messianic and non virginal. Virginal. How did Justin offer a counter given he recorded the debate? I don't. There's a huge dispute uh, over, I'm not sure what the question is, but so I'm not sure what the question is. There's a huge debate. Justin was a very early church father, mid second century, and very little of what he wrote survives, but his dispute with Trifo, and many people ascribe that to a ton whose name Rav Tarfon. We have no record of this in Jewish literature, but a part of that debate that Justin wrote, is, is it fictitious? Most scholars think it did, does survive. I'm not sure what the question is. If you want the questioner could just uh, if I spice may, it up a little I bit. I think I know. I'll just give Go you ahead. a taste of what I think they're trying to get at. There are a few early church fathers that dispute that this is virgin, like a virgin birth. And it's not necessarily messianic, I think. And I could be mistaken here, but Doc, if you're in the chat, update me here and uh, and fill me in. Let me know so we properly get your point exactly. It's hard to prove from silence. I mean, Justin never quotes Paul. That doesn't mean he wouldn't have agreed with, with Paul's teachings. And again, uh, so little of what he says survived. What is interesting about Justin, what he says in his apologies, is in... You know, Justin is very frequently speaking to pagans, pagans who were who questioned the the authenticity of the Christian claim, to say the least. So Jews at the time were not the primary enemies of, of the church. I mean, Origen had to respond to a pagan second century uh, thinker who who found Christianity to be ridiculous, and Origen writes a book that opposes it that survives to this day. So, Origen. So so you know, yeah. oh, Doc, Doc followed up by saying, "What, what, or what's, what was Justin Justin's counter polemic?" So I don't know if you're aware of that debate. You know, yes. Yeah. So of course I am. It's very famous. I mean, that there's not much that survives that does. So Justin says something very strange. He he appeals to the fact that he sort of goes wide on this and appeals to the fact that look. Don't look at the teachings of Christians to be odd, speaking to the pagan world. Is it not true that so much of what we teach could easily be found in, in your beliefs, in your God? So why is Christianity so, so odd to you? But Justin never says that he doesn't believe in the virgin birth. I don't now Justin never mentions Matthew. I mean, never he quotes Matthew, but never quotes Matthew like Matthew by name. You'd have to wait for Irenaeus to find any kind of like that. But there's nothing to indicate that Justin didn't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. He never addresses whether Isaiah 714 is actually a prophecy of the virgin birth, but it's only what survives. It's hard to say. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Woody Stock, thank you for the super chat. They said, Dear Rabbi, 
Is historical Jesus, not Paul, etc., in any way opposed to key Jewish tenets? He is well-versed in Talmud. Matthew 25 is in line with prophets, etc. Love your book, too. So the I just want to make sure I get the question. The question is, is there anything that Jesus taught that is not in line with Jewish teachings? Right. It says, in any way opposed to key Jewish tenets. He is well-versed in the Talmud. Uh, and then Matthew 25 is in line with the with prophets, etc. Love All your right. book, too. All right, thank you. All right, so let me clear this up. When you say what Jesus says, so I, ha I have to just disclaim it. What we find in the Christian Bible has no support from any contemporaneous first century writer, zero. So you're saying what the Christian Bible says that Jesus said? So <laughs> then the answer is no. It's re The teachings of Jesus were... Anything true in the New Testament isn't new, but anything new in the New Testament isn't true. Therefore, the teachings of Jesus, like he died for your sins, that's antithetical to the Jewish scriptures. I'm talking about the canon itself, and we're not talking about late books. Let's talk about Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Gave his life as a ransom for your sins. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, a ransom for your sins. Notice Luke doesn't have that verse because Luke didn't believe that Jesus died as a ransom vicariously for your sins. So, and Mark chapter 7, verse 20 is an example that therefore whatever goes into your mouth doesn't defile you. Really? So, no, and the idea that the Messiah is supposed to die and this is foretold and no, this is not foretold. So the I, so of course you will find an Ab. Look, nobody be offended, but you will find Abrahamic religions all believe that Judaism was once the only true religion in the world. No matter how Christy you are, you have to concede that Judaism was the only true faith in the world. In fact, if you press a Christian and ask him. One moment before the cross, one minute before Jesus died on the cross, there were many religions in the world. Which one was the only true one? Every Christian would concede that only Judaism was true. What iteration of Judaism? Only Pharisaic Judaism was true. It all changes at the cross. The veil is torn asunder, and that all changes, and then you have the Great Commission. So, therefore, the, the Christian Bible has to comport Muslims rightfully taunt Christians by saying you're anchored to the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament claims as such. Well, in, if Luke 24, 44 is to be taken seriously, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Torah, the prophets and the writings, human sacrifice, that's the mother load of bad ideas in the Jewish scriptures. No innocent person could die for the sins of the wicked. That's repeated throughout the Hebrew Bible. If you want to find human sacrifice, go to go to Central and South America and see what the Aztecs did with virgins. Look what the people who worship Molech did with babies, passing them through a fire. Why, why virgins and babies? They represent all that's innocent. So if we are to say that the Christian Bible really does characterize and reflect what Jesus said and taught, don't hand me Matthew 5.17. Don't do that, okay? Then take all of it. Don't do just the Sermon on the Mount. Don't give me Beatitudes, okay? Fine. You, you, you stop strawmanning this. Steel man it. That's what I'm doing, okay? So vicarious atonement, horrible idea. The Messiah to die? No. He's to rebuke nations and bring about a worldwide peace. Z, C, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. C, it's all over the place. So Jesus fills nothing that the Jewish Bible says they will fill. And then the church has to invent all these verses that were never intended to be messianic. I want to make one point for the viewers, because you have a sophisticated audience. How you pull this off, nobody knows. And <laughs> I, you can follow I'll make sure. I, I want to make a point, and your, your audience is a sophisticated audience, I think. Um, N.T. Wright, I think, is one of the leading... Um, Christian theologians in the English-speaking world today. He's really a very bright guy. Um, he, he, has, he has many intriguing ideas, as long as he intriguing ideas. But one of his like 
a really intriguing idea that many people seize, many Christians seize, is that N.T. Wright concedes that there's no one who expects the Messiah to die. No one. This is a major proposal of this. And the idea that the Messiah will die and then rise from the dead, no one believed that. No one was expecting that. Because it's nowhere found in the Jewish Bible, zero places. And therefore, so he's right. He's right. Gold star for N.T. Wright on that. And I, I respect the guy, but he's he's a Christian and he's a theologian. So he's got to make sense of it. So he goes, therefore, it has to be true. Because who would have made it up? Could you imagine? Like then, like that is the the most unfalsifiable argument possible. Like then, then every religion could be true. And if it sounds totally wacky, well, it has to be true because it's so wacky. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> but that's NT, That's a major point of NT, right? That no one expected the Messiah to die and rise from the dead. And therefore, they couldn't have been making it or it must have really happened. And we really have to believe that. If you're familiar with this, you know that I'm not setting up a straw man here. Hello? Well, maybe, just maybe... Maybe the Messiah is not supposed to die and rise from the dead. And maybe that's why when Paul sets forth his most famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, the crucifixion chapter, he says that Jesus died and rose three days later from the tomb um, to fulfill the scripture. To fulfill, and then he does not, for some wild reason, which I can't identify at this moment, he doesn't tell us what scripture it is. I wonder why. He doesn't even make up one. No, there's just nothing there. Why is there a phantom text? There is no text like that in the Hebrew Bible. It doesn't exist. Fake, fake, fake. Complete scam. So could you imagine? So you take N.T. Wright, who is a very bright guy. He's a, a prolific author. He's a he's really a smart guy. And, and this is what he comes up with. That means inherent, baked into this argument of a very bright Christian theologian, a Christian scholar, by every account, um, his whole point is premised on that it, there's nothing in the Jewish Bible, no one, no Martian in the world who can read the Bi Jewish Bible would ever believe that the tense of Christianity were a fulfillment of Judaism. Hello, that's what the Jewish people are saying. It's not. If it says smoking kills on the side of the box, that doesn't mean you just smoke. I mean, it's bad. Stay away from it. End the story. Oh, Rabbi. <clears throat> Isn't is that incredible? Interesting. Yeah, there's that that is interesting because he could have made up something. He could have pulled a Jonah quote out and Jonah came back from Shield concept or something, but he didn't even do that. So it's really interesting. He does do that. Getting to the next question, because there's, there's so many. I'm trying to catch us up here, and I know uh you plus you're embarrassing me. You're I mean, how many times you uh, even said the audience is smart how I pulled that off? We've got where are your Google reviews at? I need to go leave some reviews about you. Um, I'm sure you get plenty from Christians anyway. So yeah, yeah, they love me. <laughs> uh, Donnie hey, Springer. I, yeah. yeah, go um, ahead. I'm sorry, Donnie Springer. Thank you for the super chat. He says, "Would would Pharisaic Jews have accepted Jesus as a prophet, if not the Messiah, in Second Temple Judaism, or was there an accepted event that signaled the end of prophecy prior to this time?" Look, that's actually a very interesting question. That's really a very interesting question. So, um, so first, let me say that it's very clear, not in Tanakh, but in in Atumudic literature, that prophecy ended after the three prophets of the Persian Empire, namely Chagai, um, Zechariah, Chagai, Malachi. Okay, so prophecy ended, but that so prophecy in a uh, in a very in a classical sense, that's the end of the prophetic period that happens essentially time of Alexander the Great. That's it; it's done. Then, but we do have people who have what's called ruach hakodesh, which means people who have a divine inspiration. So it's it's a lower level. You didn't have to go into sleep and God spoke to you. So there is that's a that's a great question. So, but I, I want to now just take it a little forward. So yes, there is there is that source, uh, but. I want to say this to you. The claim that someone's a prophet is fantastic. And, and, and Judaism doesn't have a monopoly on the saying, but fantastic claims require fantastic evidence, right? Really need fantastic evidence? So and uh, this, this is a little, I'm being sneaky here, so I'm saying this, but if we're, 
to take what the Christian Bible says, that Jesus says that this generation will not pass away to all these events occurring. Many of you will not taste of death until this kingdom in full power and glory comes. This is straight in the Gospels. Well, that actually didn't happen, did it? Okay. And, and you want to, now, so if you, if you want to hang your hat on that, now I want well, a full disclosure. I don't believe those are, are historical, but if you do, you, you're in more trouble. You bring upon yourself more trouble. I think we have to confess something and we all do. We all grew up in the Christian world. The difference is that for me, Christians were chasing me. <laughs> As a kid, but we all grew, we all grew up with movies with Jimmy Stewart. It's a Wonderful Life. You know, you, you just grow up with the Christian world around you, and you just see a guy who looks like a hippie who's like just going around and healing people, and he looks great. You then notice that he's in perfect shape. You know, and then there's a point to this: he has great hair. Are you trying to say he looks like a Greek god? Is that what looks you're trying like a, to say? He doesn't look like a Jew. He looks like a Viking. And <laughs> I mean, all right. He doesn't look I like do like that Shemansky. show, by the way. That show is a really good show, Vikings. By the way, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and this is something very striking. You know, I don't know, he's 10, 15 years. I met, I'm reading the archae, an archae, a very famous archaeological magazine where they're digging up like gods of the Greco-Roman world, Hercules, whatever. And they dig them up all over the place, all over this area where I live in Israel. You know, the, the Levant, they dig up this stuff all the time. And what very, what's very striking is so many of these gods look the same way. You know, they had the long hair, like perfect BMI, like smoking perfect, not a split end. They just look great. There's no short, fat Jesus anywhere. <laughs> and there's no black Jesus. I mean, the 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 those those groups, those um, those black groups that believe that Jesus was black, they're angry for a reason, because, like, why is Jesus always a white guy? Like, you have to believe that God is a white guy. You know, if you if you live in China and you're a Christian, you have to believe that Jesus is a white guy. He's not, in, he's not, a, no one's going to believe that he's a Chinese guy. And he's tall, and he's he's got never bald. And if they found out that Jesus was short, fat, and bald, the religion would 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 tank. So, I mean, that's what it is. It's a religion about the perfect person who you will never be. That's what it is. When you go to the supermarket, you're checking out, right? You see the magazines there. Who's on the cover? Celebrities. What do they achieve? They look good. Why do they all look good? That's how they make it on the on the magazine. They look good. It doesn't mean that they're – and that's what happens. He's got to look good. He's got to look perfect. And the Jews have to look horrible. And this all is picked up in children's coloring books put out by the Protestants. So if you're a Protestant – don't give me a hard time. Your coloring books uh, all portray Jesus just looking great, and the people who didn't like him have long noses, and they all look like the character that that Stracher used in Der Strummer. So, so there's the deal. The deal is there's nothing, nothing compelling about it. Very similar. I'm going to say it's very similar to the mythological figures in the Greco-Roman world, but that's not, I don't think, a very strong point. The strong point is... That, being a prophet is a major claim. What's your evidence for it? Like, there is none. If you're not a Muslim, if you're a Muslim, you can say, I believe in the Quran. All right, you believe in the Quran. But if you're not, like, what, like, for, on what basis? There's, there's your answer. Thank you so much, Rabbi. I appreciate it. Next question is from Ken Scaletta. I hope I'm saying your name properly. Hi, Rabbi. Do you have a take on the theory that the book of Revelation was reworked from an, an originally Jewish apocalypse? It was. I mean, that's not a theory. Whoever wrote the book of Revelation took the imagery that's very unique that you find specifically in the latter books of the Jewish scriptures, told chronologically, specifically Daniel, Zechariah in particular, and used that imagery, misappropriated that imagery to advance a a Joannian Christology and a dualism of the Antichrist. It's not the only place you'll find the Antichrist. In fact, the Antichrist is named more explicitly in the letters of John, the epistles of John. But so that's not a theory. You know, 
All right. I don't, I don't mean to destroy people's livelihoods by saying this because people write books on this and do dissertations on this, but this is not complicated. In Revelation, in the book of Revelation, whoever wrote the book, I'll just assume the guy's name was John. It's not a, not a stretch. Um, the author is using the imagery, the beast imagery, the, that you find in Daniel and that you find in Zechariah. He had it in front of him, and then he used it and then had it fit into a Christological story of, and a du highly dualistic story, which is very Joannian. I mean, whoever wrote the book of John didn't write the book of Revelation, but wow, there's a lot in common. Jesus being the lamb, we talked about that earlier. The light and darkness is huge in the fourth gospel, huge in the book of Revelation. Um, the synagogue of Satan is not expressly stated in the Gospel of John, but the Jews are called the seed of the devil in John 8, 44. So all, he, all he's doing is what everyone else is doing, and that is taking Jewish ideas. And Jewish ideas were really important. The Jewish people made up a significant part of the empire. We were very, not because of our numbers, which weren't that small, but we just, like today, we're not that big, but we have enormous influence. People took Jewish books and Jewish ideas and then misappropriated them to create, uh, to massage a new religion. So, no, that's exactly what he did. Thank you so much. Dharma Defender said, Rabbi, would you be willing to debate with Dr. Carrier on how Jewish is Christianity? I think it would be a very educational debate. Hold on one second. My, uh, my mouse just died. And uh, I have that's a map. Satan, I believe. It's got to be. I was thinking yeah. that it's got to be. There's no doubt about it, especially in light of what we're discussing. But um, but yeah, I, I don't know because, yeah, it'd be an interesting, maybe a discussion. I'm not a big uh, debate fan as much as I am a discussion, but what? How would, would you be interested in doing something like that? Uh, let me confess, I don't know what Carrier holds on me these issues. Not so completely. I couldn't. So... You have Carrier on your show quite a bit. I've never spoken to him. Um, so I don't, you know, how can I say when I debate someone, I don't even know what they believe. Right. But what, what, what did he say Carrier believes? Well, it didn't, he doesn't say here, but uh, so, it's uh, to debate with Dr. Carrier on how Jewish is Christianity. Right. So, so. We, we, we wouldn't, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know what he believes, but. I don't know of anyone who doesn't believe that some elements of Judaism were plagiarized, were taken, misconstrued, and then reshaped and reformatted and fit into the uh, Christological thinking that's conveyed in not just the Gospels, but Paul's letters, which are more important because they contain the theology that the Gospels lack. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know what Carrier said says on that i don't know of a scholar in the world who does not believe you know, except the person the person a devout christian but setting that aside i don't know of anyone whether christian or not christian does not believe that christianity is using judaism and in fact if i took the most conservative christian in the world he would say not only christianity take judaism it is judaism right, it's right, the fulfillment right. of judaism so what yeah. would it would be a very boring debate i think just be interesting to hear different, maybe different ideas. I don't know. I don't but think there would be. I mean, did you? Look, you've had quite a a number of people on your show. I don't know anyone. I don't think you've ever had a guest on your show that uh, that ever said that Christianity did not take appropriate, misappropriate parts of Judaism in order to shape, mold the religion that emerged into. I mean, I have Christian scholars who said that. I mean, and I mean, I've that had there's no element yeah. of Judaism that there is no element of Judaism. Oh no, 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 no. That the opposite. I'm sorry. That that right, right. So, that they'll use things, right. kind of lift things, exactly. and appropriate them. Right, for, right. That means yeah. everyone believes that. By the way, right. this is not this view is not just the view of myself or the guests you've had. No, no, no. That means we're all on the same page. The yeah. only question is to what extent everyone believes that from the from the most liberal minimalist person doesn't have to even believe in God to the most conservative Christian world. Everyone believes that Christianity is the product of, of Judaism. Now to the Christian, it's 100% you right. know, the fundamentalist Christian and to someone else go, well, it's a, it's a mixture. It's an admixture of both Jews. So carry, I, I don't know carrier 
so, but I, I'm sure that uh, we'd be on the same page. It would yeah. be hardly be a very boring debate. Thank you so much. Jonas has a super chat and uh, thank you for the super chat, everybody. I appreciate the love. I'm going to have a, a Gnostic informant pop in here uh, at toward the end of this show, just to uh, do a tease advertisement for the show you did with him as well. So uh, just be staying tuned and hit that like button, everybody. Let's say Jonas says, let's say that I'm a Roman in the time of Jesus and I would like to convert to or join the Jewish people. How would I proceed I'm I'm want to learn about the conversion process in the early Roman Empire. Yeah, so that's uh, like the answer that very easily. If, if if you're a a man, there were four things you had to do. If you're a woman, there were three things that you had to do. Uh, you would come to the the rabbis. You would come to Jewish leaders. And the first thing is you would accept upon yourself the Torah and accept God in your life. And there was, strangely, this is, I'm not going to bring this in. I'm just going to just point this out. And you can, you guys can, it's an interesting uh, feature of the first century. And that is there was an enormous amount of conversion to Judaism during, in the from first century BC from Pompeii, let's just say that, to the destruction of the second temple. There was a lot of conversion to Judaism at that time. It's a very striking issue for historians of why that is precisely. But that's why Christianity can get traction because a lot of people wanted to convert to Judaism but weren't crazy about circumcision, keeping commandments. And Paul says, I got the perfect religion for you. That's how actually it occurs. It's mind-blowing. So, so now that I've put that into it, right, that's how Christianity takes off. Like a people, Judaism was very popular at this time. Just like it is today, like now, the Jews are, are radioactive, but everybody wants something Jewish. It's like it's the hot. If you want your church membership to double, just start doing Jewish things, and people will start showing up. So the most important thing is called Kabbalah Satoyer. That person accepts the Torah as, as given by God and has that relationship with the Almighty. That together, um, a number the, that person would bring a carbon taida which is a, uh, a thanksgiving offering, and the person would emerge in, immerse in a mikvah, in a ritual bath, as a renewal of life. Um, and if it was a man, they also would be circumcised. Uh, we don't have a altar today. We don't have a temple. So people who are converting today are not bringing, do not bring the offering. So that's what you would do. Nothing about that has changed. That's all the same. It's about accepting the Jewish faith, uh, immersing in a mikvah, uh, bringing the Thanksgiving offering, and the case of male to be circumcised. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's some people who deny that conversion or even these things didn't take place. And I'm like, uh, no, what do you, what do you mean? Uh, reading history, there's a lot of that. Uh, Starlet, yeah. thank you for the super chat. Could you ask the Rebbe, the Rebbe, I have heard many rabbis, including many I follow, who say our Mashiach has to come in the next 18 years before the eve of Shabbos of the year 6,000? Okay, so there's a big part of that's true, except for the 18 years. I can't, A, I have no idea which rabbis to went, neither do I want to know. Because I I'd, I'd rather not name names. So I, whoever it is, let's just leave it there. The Messiah has to come by the year six thousand, and we're not quite there yet. We're not eighteen years away. We're a little bit more than that. Uh, but that's a that's in the tractate Sanhedrin in the Talmud. The, the essentially these are mil, um, this is millennial units, which means just as you have four six units of time, and then you have the Sabbath. So the, in Jewish tradition, the first, the six days of creation are just six units of time. I mean, after all, the first day, there's no sun. The sun's created on the on the fourth day. So in that sense, just as there's six days of creation, and then the Sabbath comes on the seventh, so it's not just the seventh day, but now it's the seven thousandth year, because the idea that a thousand years to us is, is a day to God. So therefore... The Messiah must come by the year 6,000. We're not quite there, but we're 
quite were well far away from 18 years. Now he must come by then. He could certainly come earlier uh, because as it, as the end of Isaiah chapter 60 would indicate, which means in its time I will hasten it. And and the Sabbath could be brought in earlier. How is it triggered? By Isaiah chapter 59, verse 20 and 21. Two passages with which Paul will destroy in his misquote in the book of Romans. Shocking. But a critical passage in Isaiah tells us what will trigger the Mashiach, and that is the repentance of the Jewish people. And the Redeemer will come to Zion when to those in Jacob who repent. Paul will have no part of that. And if you read Romans eleven twenty six, Paul totally demolishes that and changes it to read, and the Redeemer will turn the hearts of Jacob back. So instead of them repenting, people can't repent in Romans in Pauline theology, especially like Romans 3. So therefore, it has to be the Messiah who's doing it. People are completely sinful creatures. Paul totally grotesquely demolishes these ecstatic passages in the book of Isaiah. So the Messiah must come by the year 6,000. Uh, we hope, um, as a religious Jew, we hope that he'll come at, come quickly in our time. Thank you, Rabbi. And we got a super chat from MCG14. Thank you. Also followed up with thoughts on Atwell's Flavian Signature. So Joseph Atwell has a position, as you're, I'm sure you're aware of, that the Romans invented Christianity. What are your thoughts about this uh, whole theory? I, I don't think I receive 200 emails a day, <laughs> but it's in that neighborhood. I mean, it's somewhere between 100 and 200 emails a day, let's say. I think. I never counted it. I'm not saying that's the most frequently asked question, but it comes up a few, a few days a week. I'll get that. The idea that the Romans invented, created Christianity, I mean, we're talking about the Flavian dynasty, which means first century, first century Rome. We're not talking about fourth century Rome. We're not talking about Constantine who converts in 312. I mean, he believes in Jesus in 312 as a result of uh, his success in the battle um, in, the, in the fall of that year. It seems so outrageous to me because the Romans disliked Christianity in every way, and it was an illicit religion. Um, so for, for many years, people said, you got to watch this film. Here's the link. Now, people send me links constantly. Now, I can't, I can't, you know, stop just watching videos. I can't do that. But at some point, I'm going, all right, everybody's sending this to me. It just seemed very, very strange to me. Because the Christians were persecuted. They, the way they thought was very, very different than the Romans. Romans were highly, uh, uh, Ro the empire lasted so long and was so successful because of its military. Christianity was not a, at that stage, was not a, a religion that you would associate with uh, militancy. So I started I started watching it on YouTube. This goes back, I don't know, a few years ago, I guess. And I just couldn't follow it. That means what happens in the film. Now, I couldn't get through it. I'm just confessing this. I couldn't get through it because the, it wasn't like whoever did this was not was lying, but it was these independent particles of truth that are very, very well, really well known to us. But then they somehow get glued together in a way that just didn't correlate with anything that's on the map. So it's not a, from what I could see, there's, there was nothing scammy about it. It just was, pow, the Pharisees did, the Sadducees believed this, the Flavian dynasty did this, Josephus was this, um, um, Spasian, Titus, so on. So P, there were all these elements that were certainly true, but they just didn't connect. They didn't, there was no glue there that held it together. And it didn't bear any resemblance to, to how the Roman Empire uh, looked, at, uh, looked at Christianity. For example, the oldest surviving, uncontroversially, uh, I didn't put those words in, 
there's no controversy that Pliny the Younger's um, writings on Jesus in the year 112 is authentic. Okay, and what is that? That is the first, the the earliest um, mention of Jesus of Christianity by a non-Christian that we have. The stuff in Josephus is complete nonsense, complete fake. Testimonium Flavium, garbage in, garbage out. It's all fake. So what Pliny the Younger is stating there, that the, the empire was very unhappy that Christians were gathering illegally because you needed a permit to have gatherings. And Christianity was not a recognized religion. And the empire was very nervous about insurrection really nervous about that, and they didn't want people gathering for meetings without the appropriate measures in place so that nothing, that they would, it was North Korea, guys, it was Kim Jong-un, right, but with a funny hat. So the deal is that that doesn't in any way comport with Tacitus. Tacitus is our most important Roman historian, and Tacitus was no Jew. He was a blue-blooded Roman, born in Rome. He was born in the 50s. I mean, he, and Tacitus is very, a very credible historian, the most, for reasons that are beyond the scope of this. Tacitus writes about how Nero executed Christians, blamed them for burning down Rome. And, and it's based on that Primarily that Christians hate Nero, and 666 would almost certainly be um, Kaiser Nero's name in Hebrew gematria. So it just, here's the deal, you guys, listen very carefully. Fantastic claims require fantastic evidence. That's, that's I, I, And I have to see evidence that rises to the level of that kind of claim, and, and I don't see it. Now, maybe someone smarter out there that does. Maybe someone does. I couldn't get it. And I, I tried watching it. It's well done, but I just, I, it did not glue together. There were ideas that each idea independently worked, but they didn't click. In my view, the one did not uh, trigger the next. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Rabbi. Uh, we got quite a few super chats here, so I'm going to try and work through these because <clears> – <throat> Look, uh, I'm not the Roman Empire, and I'm not paying you. You're not on my payroll, so, you know, I can't, you know. I should, I get a commission, no? Right. Well, I get paid by the Illuminati, but <laughs> you get paid by the Illuminati? I, I, I should get a, a cover and a commission and a tip and a thing. Okay, go ahead. We got to talk about that after the show. Um, we'll, Doc, we'll have a, yes. <laughs> thank you, Doc, for the uh, super chat. How did uh, violent rip? Uh, rhetoric, Melito's Passover sermon of the side, influenced Jewish self-thought in the milieu of Roman state religious persecution. Do I need to repeat it? No, 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 not at all. No, very well done. Very delightful, whoever you are. Really nice. So Melito, who is sharing, he's a roommate with with, with Goebbels and Streicher, who's a grotesque individual, but a, a, unfortunately a very good writer. And we have his Passover uh, screed on the Jews, calling them Christ killers and holding, holding them accountable for the most serious charge of committing the unthinkable crime of killing God. It's so stupid, because like, if we didn't kill him, like, he would have, he would have died of Alzheimer's and you'd have no religion. Like, you should be thanking us. I mean, in your way of thinking, it's so ridiculous. You know, it's like, it's like in, in many European countries where people are not religious, like we don't believe in Jesus, but we know the Jews killed him. It's like, makes no sense at all. So, now, so the, this idea that the Jews were the most horrible people in the world is doesn't just belong to that, um, to that grotesque individual, but in fact, it was shared by all the church fathers. They all thought that way. It's just that's a really old document that survives, and we're fairly certain it's authentic, unlike Ignatius's letters, which, which reek of fabrication. But Ignatius was no fan of the Jews. Ignatius is a really early church father. Um, Tertullian really didn't like us. 
And all you have to do, go online. What did the church fathers say about the Jews? And you, the quote will go in endlessly. Now, here's the what I what is very delightful, what's very tasty about the question is the questioner is asking what effect does it have on Jewish thinking? And the answer is we don't know. And probably not very important. Why? Because at that time, talking the second century, Judaism was an official religion of the Roman Empire, highly esteemed. The Romans did not go to war with us because of theology. We went to war with the Romans for a whole bunch of reasons. Taxes, but it wasn't, they, they didn't believe what we believed, but they respected us, as the Greeks did, for, because we, for our antiquity and a host of other reasons. So, uh, so as it turns out, Judaism was a licit religion, was a, an officially sanctioned religion. Not only were we sanctioned, Jews were exempt from bringing the offerings to the state gods, which others were not, which got Christians in trouble. That's why the, the Atwell story doesn't make sense to me at all. You see, people were compelled to bring offerings to the state, to the gods, to the great gods of Rome, to participate in some way, to contribute to them in some way. People did not pray to Jupiter. Okay, you didn't go home and your wife wasn't conceiving. You turned to Jupiter or Zeus and you know help me out. They were too big, but there were state celebrations, and everyone in the empire had to participate. But the Jews were exempt. That's how far it went. The Jews were exempt because the Jews had special deal. And that is, we were monotheists, we would not accept any other god, and the Romans accepted that. So we literally had like a free pass on that deal. Conversely, Christianity was a completely illicit religion. Illicit. Strangely, the emperor that preceded Constantine was Diocletian, who recused himself at the end, but he probably persecuted the Christians more than anyone did since Nero. So, therefore, listen very carefully. In the anti nicene period, in the period prior to the Council of Nicaea, that means in the 2nd and 3rd century, anything that Christians said from the lectern was just rhetoric to the Jew. It had no influence. It had no force. It had no bite. Why? Because the Christians were in no position to carry out any threat against the Jew because the Jew had a faith that was sanctioned by the empire, and the Christians, conversely, had a religion that was considered illegal, illicit in the empire. So therefore, this is this everything is going to change in the fourth century. Because from when you begin with Constantine and then end with Theodosius, end of the fourth century, where Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire, Theodosius reconvenes over the doctrine of the Trinity at the Council of Constantinople in 381. By the end of the fourth century, estimate 50% of the empire Christian, that's a nightmare. So what I'd like to do for you just historically is contrast what it would be like to be a Jew in 326 versus being a Jew in one. 36 in the empire. In 136, you can scream about the Jews all you want. The Romans wouldn't care. So these church fathers who hated us, whatever rhetoric they expressed was irrelevant to the Jews. But in 326, it made a really big difference. And guess what happened? You know what they did with the Jews after the Council of Nicaea? Council of Nicaea was convened in the summer of 325. Do you know that in 326, all the Jews were expelled from Jerusalem? Do you know that? And do you know how long the Jews were not permitted to enter into Jerusalem? 35 years, till 361. What happened in 361? Your viewers who, who are erudite in the, in the history, 361, Julian the apostate, not a Christian. He goes, all right, I'm not a Christian. You guys can come back. So Jews are expelled from Jerusalem. That's how we're treated. So it's a real, what a Christian says, expresses, what Tertullian says about the Jews in the second, he's, let's say around 200, is not relevant to Jews. Why? Because you're like just some drunk Latin-speaking slob on the street throwing up and screaming Jew boy. But if somebody says that in the 4th century, in the 5th century, we're in a lot of trouble because now you have the force of the empire behind you. 
So therefore, that's a great, that's a delightful question. And that should tell you everything changed for the Jews in the fourth century. Christianity is meaningless to the Jews in the earlier century. Why? Because Christianity was had no power, didn't have the empire. They were in trouble. After Constantine, everything changes. Great question. <laughs> who, who had a little mind blown right there? That was a little bit mind blowing. That was Isn't wonderful. That Isn't yeah, that really interesting? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And then and then you imagine it took and then the Byzantine Empire would frequently do. You know, Tamakas, I just want to add this in because I want to like fill you guys up with this stuff. So the Byzantine Empire, those creeps, what they used to do is they would let the Jews introduce them once a year. Uh, they they would take you know, after Jews would have to pay a tax for this, and on the ninth day of Av, which which was the ninth day of the fifth month, the Jews were permitted into Jerusalem to pray on the day the temple was destroyed to mock them. And this was typically done through the through the Byzantine Empire. Thank you, Christianity. Thank you, Rome. I don't know what we would do without the church. Every day, I thank God for this church that helped us. But this is the impact. So, guys, realize for the Jews, everything changes in the fourth century. I don't care about homos. Um, I don't care about the homos hypostatic union. Forget all that. What yeah. changes is the the predicament of the Jew in the empire. Wow. I'm going to try and progress this forward here, Rabbi. This is amazing. Everybody, I know you're going to probably want to rewatch this. I'd love to see this clip. You know, these are some wonderful uh, segments. So, Mr. Morpheus, thank you for the super chat. He said, what's your thoughts on henotheism in ancient Judaism? Oh, I think Rabbi just accidentally backed out on accident here. Let's see. Making sure we get him back here. Um, he may have accidentally popped out. Let's see if we can get him to answer this here. He's probably like accidentally hit the wrong button. Do Do you think he likes me, Neil, or do you think he? Do you, do you think, think he cold feet on that last question? I I don't think he no. wants to answer the heat. No. <laughs> <laughs> what happened, Rabbi? Let me text him here. He's probably uh, he probably uh might have lost his internet connection or something. That's possible. Oh, there he is. There's Here the man are. with the plan. All right, I'm taking you down, Neil. We're gonna this get you busy. again. This is the second coming of Rabbi Tovi Singer. Go ahead. I was about to say, yeah, you weren't killed, but um, you're coming back. So uh, what's your thoughts on henotheism in ancient Judaism? Do you think that uh, – what are your thoughts about it? I don't put words in your mouth. My thoughts are Zichru Roshan Ismail. Remember the, the earliest moments of your time. Ki anochi el, for I am Lord, the ein od. There is no other God. For F is Kamoni, and there is nothing like me. That's what I think about. That's Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. I think about Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. Ato hares ladas, you have been shown so you might know. Ki Hashem hu Elohim, for the Lord is God. Ein od novado, there's no one else besides him. The whole of the Jewish scriptures scream this message that there's just nothing else. That I, I share my glory with no one. There's no one before me, no one after me. There is no other power besides me. I am the one. Anochi, anochi Hashem. I, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no other Savior. So all of the Hebrew Bible conveys the message that there is one God and no else. Where people get into trouble is they scour the Jewish scriptures looking for any passage that might be construed to convey a different message. And you can do that. You can do that because the convention in Tanakh is different in that if you're an angel and you're acting on behalf of God, you can be called a God in Tanakh. It's just the way Tanakh spoke, the Hebrew Bible spoke. We never talk that way. In the Hebrew Bible, people who acted as a prophet on behalf of God were called a God, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. So the idea that there were multiple powers, now this is very important, that means an independent agency, independent agency, there were powers, but their source was from God. But that there should be an independent agency, this is completely rejected in Jewish scriptures. And henotheism, henotheism is that really strange Greek word. 
that literally means like Heno, one theism, God. But it really means that there's one great God and then there's other minor deities, but those deities actually are independent. So that did not exist in the Jewish scriptures. But the Jewish scriptures are very vulnerable to this because there are messengers of God, angels, prophets, but they can't operate independently. Satan does whatever God orders him to do in the book of Job. So it's very, very clear in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, uh, let's keep moving because we've got so many super chats. I've, I just want to try and get through them and, and uh, sure. see where we go. William Arons, did I get the making sure I hit the right, didn't skip anybody here. Yeah, uh, William Arons, thank you for the super chat. He says, what about Jephthah sacrificing his daughter, God telling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and God drowning all humans except for Noah and his family? That's literally the question. Okay, so let me take Yiftach, your first one. All right, all right. So this comes up a lot, and I'm not going to say I don't know why it does, but I, I, it's important. I, I say this to you, the viewers. I mean, you're watching this. You're not watching I Love Lucy. I mean, that means you're interested in religion in some reason, right? Well, I always say to you, like, read it for yourself, because one of the things I almost never do is quote a scholar unless there's some point here but i'm never doing that for a point of authority the book of judges contains events that are disasters over that occurred over the course of a span of many centuries during the period of the judges judges doesn't mean a judge but that was a a very loose confederacy okay the point of the book of Judges is that we need to get to a king because everyone's doing whatever they want to do and no one is, we don't have a unified power. And that's where Samuel begins. So Samuel takes off from that. The story of Yiftach, who was a general, not liked at all, but he was a brilliant uh, uh, military giant. He was just brilliant. And therefore, when the Jews got into trouble from our enemies, we wanted the Moshe Dayan. We wanted the, the smartest, you know, the smartest kid on the guy who really understood military strategy. We wanted to call him up and say, "All right, no one really likes you, but we need you because you're the brilliant general." And he gets called up, and he defeats the enemy. He does exactly what he's called to, and people didn't like him as he wasn't. In other, you know how people are geniuses in the laboratory, but take them out and they're lunatics. So he, this was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He, on his coming back from battle, or his chest is all inflated. He's all, he says, you know what? The first thing that comes out of my home, he's going home from battle. He's a hero. He's a war hero. The first thing that comes out, I'm going to offer as a sacrifice to God. What happens? His daughter walks out. And he decides that, well, you know, he loved her, but what choice do I have? And he he doesn't really kill her, but he, she never enjoys intimacy. She's never married, and she's put in a remote place. Let's just say she's put to, to kill. The text reads that way. If you look carefully, it's that she dies a virgin. She she Let's just say she's sacrificed. That was certainly his interest, so we'll, we'll keep it that way, okay? Who here failed? Everybody but his daughter. The point of the story is that don't do stuff like that. The whole point of the story is Yiftach was an idiot. And not only was he an idiot, you needed enablers. You needed other idiots to make that idiot idea come to light. What had happened? What happened to the Jewish leadership? Well, if Yiftach would have only come to the priests, to the judges at the time, and go, look, I, I made this vow coming back from battle, and it turns out it's my kid. It's my kid, Rebecca. She's really cute, you know, and I just, like, put new braces on her mouth. So, like, she's got a I, – I don't, I don't want to do this to her. They would have told you don't have to. That's, it was a ridiculous vow. They would nullify it in a second, as the Talmud proclaims. And what happens if a pig would have come out of his house? Would he then offer that as an offering to God? So it's a story about failure. It's not a story about success. It's not a – Nothing in the book of Judges, none of these events are, are there to tell you this is how you should behave. On the contrary, the prophets were written for a number of reasons, but a main theme in the prophets, the prophetic part of the Hebrew Bible, is to convey every stupid mistake that the Jews made and don't do anything like that. 
So that's the story of Yiftach. It's like everything fails. And therefore, look at the last passage of the book of Judges. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes because you had this loose, loose confederacy. We need a united uh, monarchy with a king, and that's what's going to happen in Samuel. Judges is a is the is the introduction to Samuel. The reason why the book of Judges is there, the primary purpose of the book of Judges is to convey why you need a king, and it's just not good enough to have a loose confederacy under a judge. Not a judge as in a court, but a judge means like a kind of leader, let's say, like kind of a governor, we'll just use that term, which whose powers were very, very limited. And it ends, in the book of Judge ends with a horrible civil war where an entire, almost an entire tribe is wiped out. The tribe of Benjamin was almost um, completely destroyed in a civil war. I mean, that's how, that's like, so it's not telling you civil wars are good. So therefore, no, you... God said, don't, don't harm the kid, and there's a ram in the thicket, and bring that instead. I don't want you to do that. So, no, human, human sacrifices are a very bad idea. You can't bring a story, an event in the book of Judges as a proof that human sacrifice is sanctioned. The whole reason it's there is to tell you that, no, it's, a, it's, it's the mother load of bad ideas. Great question. Hey, babe, sacrifice the first thing that comes to the door. Hey, uh, thank you for that answer, Doc. I appreciate it, Rabbi. And uh, seriously, there's always a bunch of people who have uh, questions like this, so I appreciate you taking it. Uh, moving on, MJT. Did Jews think Daniel 9 predicted the Messiah's death? That's an interesting question. Uh, by, my, by the way, I just want to give you a heads up. I think we got like 12 more questions after this. So I don't know if there's a way to answer them in some uh, swift way or whatnot, but I always want... I just don't want to pressure you. You, you to want to stay here overnight. It's That's it's right. like the no, no no it's it's so good because it's in here in Jerusalem it's uh I don't know what time it's like twenty to one it's fine I'm a night person it's okay fine. um so the answer is no but I'm gonna blow your mind away so Daniel nine has nothing to do with it's nothing to do with the date of when the Messiah will be killed and I know it says the Messiah will be cut off. You know, not himself. I know that. I know what your Christian Bibles did with that. Okay, but if you ask, so you have a chapter, Daniel nine, has twenty seven verses, and the problem, my friends, is that I'm sure there are Christians here, and that Christians really know Daniel nine, verse twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, and twenty seven. But if I ask you, what's in Daniel chapter nine, verse I don't know, verse seven? What is in Daniel nine, verse one? Like, and why is it important that it's in the first year of Darius the Mede? Like, why is that relevant? And why is Daniel trying to figure out the calculations of Jeremiah germane to anything? And I'm going to say this, please don't be angry at me. You Christians have no idea, not because you're bad people. It's because the church robbed you of this knowledge. Now I'm going to take this step. I'm going to amp this up. I'm going to charge it up. I'm going to tighten it up. Not only is this, this, ridiculous theological machination something that Christians today subscribe to no Jews thought that because it's not there I have I have chapters in my books on this but even the first century Christians never thought of this what do you know that the supposed calculation that the Messiah is going to be killed after 490 years which is 70 weeks that calculation is never quoted in the Christian Bible do you know that? I bet you know. You know what insane that is? I mean, if you're a Christian, please think about this. This is what you're going to have to believe. You're going to have to believe that anybody thought that Daniel 9 predicted when the Messiah would be killed, and we have a precise date for it, and that Paul, the author of Hebrews, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, I went in chronological order, they were aware of this. And they just didn't think that was important enough to mention. Do you know how much propofol you have to ingest to believe that? This is a later invention. This, this is a second century invention of the church. They completely molested the ninth chapter of Daniel. It has nothing to do with that. Daniel 9 is a prediction made by the angel Gabriel to Daniel in a response to his plea to understand a calculation of Jeremiah 
read it for yourself, and conveys to him the length of time, the span of time, between destruction of the first temple, destruction of the second temple, and an anointed one who would who was a prince who would give the command to rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple, there's only one person who's a Messiah like that. And that's Cyrus. See Isaiah 44, verse 28, and the really important one, Isaiah 45, verse 1. Cyrus, my Messiah, who gave the command to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. There it is. Cyrus, not Jesus. I didn't put it. And please, don't use a Jewish Bible for this. Use your Christian Bible. Use your, your, your King James Bible. Use your Catholic Bible. Use your any Bible you want. See Isaiah 45, verse 1. You know, there were Trump supporters who thought that Trump was kind of a Cyrus figure, and that's why Trump was the 45th president. And the the idea that Cyrus, who tells the Jews, go back and build Jerusalem, and then Trump goes and put moves the embassy, the American embassy, to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. And therefore, Trump, number 45, fills Isaiah 45. I'm not kidding. So that's, this is completely absurd. So not only didn't the Jews think this, the Christians didn't think of it. This is a later invention, and therefore it never even made it into the New Testament. Bingo. Interesting. <laughs> wow. I'd say. All right, next super chat, Uber Scheiser. I hope I'm saying that right. I don't know. I'm, I hear that's a cuss word in German, I thought. Uh, anyway, Rabbi Singer, your content and arguments are a great resource for atheist anti-apologists countering the falsehood of Christianity. What are your feelings or thoughts that they also believe Judaism is, false, is a false belief? What do I believe about atheists who not only... Uh, feel that Christianity is false, but believe that Judaism is false as well. Right. So I'll, I'll answer very quickly two points that I think are germane that just jump out at me. The, there's no therefore there. That means Christianity can't be true without Judaism. Christianity completely depends on Judaism in, for its validity. And I'm not this is not a straw man. The, the New Testament is filled with claims that the Hebrew Bible points to Jesus. The Hebrew Scriptures points to Jesus. Second Timothy three sixteen, Luke twenty four forty four. If you have, if you believed in Moses, you would have believed in me. For Moses wrote about me, John five forty six. So I'm just I'm not setting up a straw man here. We don't depend, Judaism doesn't depend on Christianity. Christianity is completely irrelevant to us. So if somebody rejects the God of Christianity, the Christian God, there's no therefore that Judaism isn't true. It means Judaism stands on its own. And as it turns out, the, the very algorithms that demonstrate that Christianity is a false religion, I'm using just really simple language here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to. I just want to be very clear. That same algorithm demonstrates the veracity of the Jewish claim. It's not important who wrote the book. It's important that there was a national revelation, a Jewish experience. Every Jewish holiday, the entire nation was there, part of it. So if we take the very reasons why Christianity is false and then ask the question about the Jewish experience, we're talking about a nation, the algorithm that dismisses Christianity demonstrates the veracity of Judaism. That's a just a simple point. That's just cognitively. There is a feeling that I've never expressed in my life, and this is really personal. I've never said this to anyone. And in truth, Derek is, is a personal dear friend. Really, I, um, I've never said this to him because it'll go to his head. But I, I, I really, really love, I really... I really care about him a lot. We're, we're good buddies, full disclosure, okay? And, I, and I, it's, I'm doing this on air, and I'm, he and I have never had a theological conversation off here. And I know he won't mind if I say that. Because we're friends. I don't have those things with But I do. So this is personal. This is me speaking. I blame Christianity for for atheism because the Christian God that atheists 
who grew up in the Christian world reject, I also reject. So there is, in this is totally personal, so please don't send me 500 emails. And I know Derek won't mind me saying, this is just my feelings. You know, up to now, this has just been a very highly cerebral interview where I'm bringing proofs and sources and bang, and it's black and white. And I need to do that. These are really important issues. But here I'm just being, letting my feelings run. When I, personally, when I see uh, atheists who, and I'm going, what, you, you, could you give us a chance? Because we are the default baseline. If Christianity falls, that means if Jesus wasn't the Son of God, he wasn't the Messiah, and didn't die for anybody's sins, then it reverts back to the default baseline, which is Judaism. Then Judaism has to be addressed. And that's weird. That's what I wish. And I am, my rage towards Christian. I've never said this publicly. I've thought about it a lot. My hurt, my pain, a rage towards the church is partially uh, inflamed by my affection for the atheists that I do know, because I charge you with Christianity for the crime of robbing people who might otherwise connect themselves to the Jewish faith. But Christianity is such a hideous religion, and when Christians discover it, they often just... Um, Turn their, they feel just completely let down by faith. And I can see that. I can hear the anger and the rage. And this is a personal issue. I, Derek is a very, really different. I love him very much. And, and I say that uh, from my heart. And it's just a feeling I have. That's how I, so th there's your answer. So cognitively and then personally, I, I hold Christianity um, I condemn Christianity uh, for this crime against Christians. Thank you for your question. Love you too, Rabbi. Uh, continuing in Super Chats. Magical Chemical Daddy, interesting name. Zechariah 3.8 predicts that Joshua will, in another day, call every man his neighbor under the fig tree. Something only Jesus did. Reincarnation? I don't, I don't understand the point. I don't either. <laughs> Zechariah 3.8 predicts that Joshua will, in another day, quotation mark, call every man his neighbor under the fig tree, something only Jesus did. So it's almost like uh, he's saying reincarnation, like Jesus is supposedly fulfilling a, uh, a Zechariah 3.8 quote where Joshua will, in another day, call every man. Is this just mimesis? Are the we New talking Testament? about another text in Zechariah? Zechariah chapter 3 is discussing a man named Yeshua, Joshua. But it's Joshua the high priest who's brought before Satan. There is a branch that appears um, in, the book of, in the book of Zechariah chapter 6. Uh, that branch is Zerubbabel. And what is, if you want to go figuratively, so Zerubbabel, who is that? So he's a Davidic, he's from the Davidic dynasty, and he's very important in books like Zechariah, which is written during the Persian Empire. And although he never becomes king, he's the governor and a leader and the continuation of the Davidic dynasty. Now, does, I, I, I it's none Zechariah. I don't. There's nothing in Zechariah three that's saying what you're saying, and not only that, Jesus is cursing a fig tree. So I don't even know understand how that applies. But what you can extrapolate is that by preserving the Davidic dynasty through Zerubbabel, that means that the Davidic promises continue, and that. What you would find in cha Micah chapter 4, where every man sits under his tree and there's complete peace and, and no one will make the people afraid any longer, which is a, a very big prophecy in the Jewish scriptures. See the book of Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. So this comes up a lot. That's exactly what Jesus didn't do. So if the Messiah, so let me take your point, however you meant to word it, I'm just going to just, Use that. I'll sort of use the gravitational pull of the moon to 
get the orbit going and get the rocket back to Earth. <laughs> so let's do that. That means if we are to say that the role of the Messiah is so that people will be sheltered at peace under their fig tree, that people will no longer be afraid. Again, um, Micah chapter 4, Zephaniah chapter 3, just... And let's just say that the text in Zechariah are figuratively, the branch is not just referring to what's immediately right there, uh, Zerubbabel, but it's referring to his great-great-grandson, the Messiah in the future. You're not solving the problem that Christianity has. You're amping it up. Because that just goes on the long list of another thing that Jesus didn't do. He didn't bring peace to the world. He didn't allow that people could sit and relax. He didn't even call for peace, but rather in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 36, Verily I say unto you, I didn't come to peace on earth, but the sword, to set people against their family. A man's foes will be them of their own household. How does that figure into peace? So if I grant you this for whatever reason, I just want to grant it to you, you have all your work ahead of you. These kinds of figuratively, the, you, you don't do apologetics figuratively. You just, I mean, you can't defend a religion using figuratively because then anything could be figuratively. I mean, the Catholic Church has stuff like this. The Mormons have this text figuratively means the Immaculate Conception. It's not there. Well, I don't care. So you, there's a difference between a, a, an apologetic, which means a defense, of faith, which you need to have evidence to do faith. And then there's a homily. You want to make a homily and go say the fig tree here, the fig tree there. That's not apologetics. And what Christians do is that line between homily and apologetics. Look, anybody can get up at a lectern and make a speech and say, this is figuratively that, but that's not a defense. You've done nothing to demonstrate that point. You want to believe it? Go ahead, believe it. But I would posit to you that these homilies that Christians engage in not only do not go a long way to defend, to bolster the Christian religion, but rather they italicize and highlight why Christianity is a false religion. Thank you for your question. Interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let me try and catch up where we were. Wow. Uh, let me back us up here real quick. We have a ton and ton and ton of super chats. And uh, we are running. Was it? So go ahead. We I'm trying. Yeah, that's question. what I was trying. I'm trying to get through uh, through these super so, chats. I mean, I mean, I just want to complete that. So, in that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree. You know, that's great. So, let's just say, can I just want to get that point? Let's just can see that that's talking about the Messiah. Well, that's exactly what Jesus didn't do. That's just another reason why Jesus can't be the Messiah. I mean, that's, anyways, we'll Thank continue. You. That's how most of these things go. Um, Dahelawil, I hope I'm saying your name properly. I love the rabbi. Thanks for what you do. Thank you for the support, my friend. I appreciate the compliment. Jason Stewart asks, why did Gam Gamaliel curse the Nazarenes if in 62 AD Jews saw James, brother of Jesus, as the righteous? And was James allowed to enter the sanctuary? Oh, back, back, whoa. Who, what? So uh, so could you just read, just read that again? Yeah, I'll read it slow. Why did Gamaliel curse the Nazarenes if in 62 AD... You're, you're, now you're told, just, I need to know, in where, where did he curse them? You're talking about the Gamaliel who's quoted in the book of Acts? I think that they're, it's the same person they're trying to say. Well, the Gamaliel in the book of Acts died in the 50s, so I don't, I don't know... Wrong. I I I I don't, I I don't remember his date of death at the moment, but I'm pretty sure Gamliel died in the fifties. Okay. And uh, James the Just, James, you know, it's brother of Jesus, yeah, yeah, the brother of Jesus. You know, it's very interesting about James. I, I can't comment on that. I, mean, I don't know what the context is, but it's interesting that the Church Fathers had a problem. I'm just inserting this because it's interesting. I never get a chance to talk about. It. Church Fathers had a conundrum of. Why wasn't the temple destroyed when Jesus was crucified? If Jesus was the temple, and that's conveyed all over the New Testament, and the sacrificial system of the temple had no value, no purpose, the a time for the temple to have been destroyed by anybody would have been when Jesus died. And in fact, that's figuratively conveyed in both the Gospels where the veil was torn down at the crucifixion before or after. It's not important. Ephesians, early Ephesians, the, the 
the point is, like, why didn't God just destroy the whole thing? So church fathers argued, in fact, that, that in fact, that James was such a, a tzaddik, such a just, righteous person, that, and he died essentially in, like, 69, so, like, God kept the temple around as long as he was around. But that doesn't jive well with their belief that there's a quote in Josephus about James who would have been killed in 62. And it's interesting that I hear people trying to defend the James being killed, who is the brother of the Lord, in a supposed quote uh, in Antiquities, which I don't believe is authentic, who is definitely a side note of a scribe on Josephus that crept its way into the text. It's not authentic. But that James would be 62, which would go against the chronology of the church fathers, which said that James died literally right before the temple was destroyed. So as soon as James died, the temple was destroyed, because then there's just no one righteous in the world, and hence James is just. There's just an interesting spin, but I can't address the other thing. Hence, thank you for your question. Thank you, Rabbi. We're going to speed things up just a smidge to try and get through these so we can— You're so cute. You always do this. It's good. I, I well, don't I mean to. Two, this is yes, amazing. Do. Yeah. I, I do, but we— like we said, I have to tell you that off air. So Gamliel the Elder, I think, died in the 50s. I'm not 100% sure of that, but you, you, could, you, know, you guys can look that up. Nicholas, thank you. He says, another great guest. Thanks, Derek. I appreciate the compliment and the support. Donnie Springer, not to be controversial, but some of the laws and punishments in the Torah regarding improper offerings, adultery, homosexuality, etc., never seem to be implemented. Why is this if this is the word of God? Do you have a mm. brief way of answering some of these? Because I know they're oh, really complicated. Oh, you kids. I'm putting no, not, it's not complicated. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not, it's not, it's really good. It's really good. Okay, so another thing I'm about to say is politically correct, okay? Because we need to leave this world of political correctness in, in order for me to address this question, okay? So please just all that, all that stuff leave out. The question is, the Torah is telling us that there are certain relationships. Leviticus 18. I'm just going to take homosexuality. I'm I'm going to take the most provocative of all of them. Okay, so male homosexuality is forbidden in the Torah. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Okay, Torah is simply saying that that relationship, that sexual intercourse between two men, is spiritually destructive, and that person deserves the death penalty and would get the death penalty. Okay. It, it would be, it means from from the text, it's, the text is simply saying, you don't get it, this will kill you. Now, again, I need your viewers to understand that we need to suspend everything that's out there because you're asking me a question of what is the Torah saying. The book is conveying that there are certain relationships that are forbidden and certain that are that are, are sanctioned. And a relationship between two men, a relationship between a man or a woman with a very close relative, a relation between a person, a man or a woman with an animal is forbidden. The Torah is here to say, look, the creator of the heavens and the earth is telling you that this is really bad for you. It's horrible. Don't do it. Even though there's no reason why it shouldn't be permissible, I'm the creator. I'm telling you, this is a, a very bad idea. Don't do it. And you deserve a death penalty. Now, I use the word deserve. You're wondering... Why do I insert that word? I'll show you why. Because as it turns out, the, the laws of evidence as such, see Deuteronomy 17, makes it impossible to ever carry out the death penalty in such a person. So the Torah views this, the Jewish people view this as the warning on a pack of cigarettes. When a very important American federal agency doesn't want you to smoke and puts the words on the side of a pack of cigarettes says smoking kills. They, the federal government does not want people to die. They don't want them to get cancer, stroke, heart disease. They don't want you to get any of those things that they announce on the box. But they're saying, look, even though you're smoking a cigarette, you may not feel anything, this thing is going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. Don't do it. Strikingly, if you go to the store and buy a set of silverware from Walmart, just, you know, like forks and knives, it might say, keep out of reaching children, but it does not say, and if you stab yourself in the head, you're going to die. Why? Because it's obvious. You don't need the explanation. But it's not apparent when you look this tobacco leaf that this thing is going to kill you, but it will. So the Torah is telling you that this is the most destructive thing and deserve to die. However, 
The Torah doesn't want you to die. It wants you to repent. The Torah does not, I'm not going to, Torah does not sanction this relationship. You may have a, a desire for it, and but just don't carry it out because spiritually it's very destructive. But let's think about this for a moment. That means I want to imagine that. So you have two men who get together privately and they, they have a homosexual act. Okay? In order for them to receive death penalty, you require a set of standards that are impossible to carry out. You need two witnesses who see it. Really? You actually see it. Can't be two guys kissing in Cape Cod. Okay? It can't be two guys holding hands in the village going into a hotel room. That's not the standard. The standard is so high, the bar is so high in terms of evidence that it makes it impossible to carry out these death penalties. So it's perfect. It's exquisite. Again, I'm asking you to arrest your sensibilities of the 21st century. We need to ask an objective question. Does a text tell us that there's a whole series of relationships that are forbidden and will destroy you? Is that intrinsically wrong? Well, if God wrote that book, the God of Israel is saying that incest, homosexuality, uh, bestiality, and yes, the text equates all of them, except female homosexuality is not brought up at all. And it's just possible because women can't have sex. So, uh, so as such, it's, it's exquisite that Torah is saying that relationship is forbidden, but the way it's set up is that you, it, it, it can't be carried out in a law of order. You can't be executed for it. I mean, theoretically, you'd have to have two witnesses who see the act, who warn them, you know what you're doing, you deserve death penalty. They have to respond and say, we know that, and they're continuing this act. And then if those two witnesses are in terror, it's never happened. We are told, even in the Talmud, that a court that executed more than one person in 70 years was considered a, a Besdin Catalan, a Saramaic, a killer Besdin. It means death penalties were virtually never carried out. They happened. It was very rare. So rare, one in 70 years. Because the purpose of these, you shall be put to death, you shall be put to death, are not there because we actually expect a Besdin to ever put someone to death. It almost never happened. Why? The rules of evidence are just so high that it was just impossible. But the point is conveyed. You can't understand, but that relationship is illicit. I, want, I know you told me to rush. I, I want to just say this one minute point. I remember a night that I was staying up with this young Jewish man who was in the became a Christian in the Messianic movement, and we stayed there for many hours, and he repented. And he said to me, Rabbi, I have a problem. And I li was listening to him, and he was having a lot of trouble getting it out of his mouth. And I knew what was coming. He, said, he finally got it out of his mouth that he's a attracted to men. I don't remember the words. This goes back years. Okay, Whatever it was, he, he just explain, expressed to me that he was attracted to men. And I said to him, you're really very lucky. He went, what? I said, yeah, you're very lucky. Why? Because after 120 years, when I stand before God, is God going to reward me for not living the life of a homosexual man? Probably not. Why? It's not a, it's not, it's not a behavior that, that would interest me at all. But you, you could say, look, I find some men attractive, but I know that you, God, Hashem, you don't want me to have that kind of relationship, and I won't do it. You know what your reward will be? You know how you're expressing your intense love for God by that demonstration of faith? You're very fortunate. That's the Jewish view of looking at it. It's not the desire for it, but it's the, what are you going to do with that desire? There it is. Thank you, Rabbi. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you for the questions, everybody. Uh, really interesting yes. questions. Nicholas said, rewatch. I want to book him. Great guest. So I've got a friend, another channel who would love to talk with you, obviously. I, and, and if I, look, I say this to you, well, I mean, if, if some of the things we talked about are provocative, a little provocative. And I might have offended someone. If I did, I really am sorry. I, 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 I try my best to convey things in a way that would make the best sense. But these are very delicate topics. And I know for some of the viewers, this must be an issue that touches 
deep, and I'm, I'm very sorry if something I said in some way may have offended you. I do know you don't want applesauce in the show. I'm very certain that you have other things to do with your life than listening to a rabbi in Jerusalem. So I know you want it straight. You don't want to have elevator music. So I'm giving you straight, but thank you for the question. Thank you. Sean Day says, is my understanding correct? Jews handle religion. Gentiles just need to follow Noahide laws. And we'll just yeah. talk through some of these, if you don't mind. Let, 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 let's do that, because we're it's 1.05 in the morning. But yep, we'll, we'll, yep. So, um, all right. So, all right. So, the word Gentile is a Gentile word. <laughs> <laughs> it's Latin, so, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's not not a Jewish term. I remember I used to do news talk radio for many different stations, including I, I did news. I I used to be a guest host on news talk radio shows, and I remember once sitting in for a fairly well known radio show host in Toronto, and someone called in, "Why do you Jews call us Gentiles?" And I went, "We actually don't. You guys do that." So. It, Judaism, every person is created in the image of God. That's why we don't try to convert non-Jews to Judaism, because you don't need to be Jewish to be saved. You can, there are two paths. It's not two paths, but it's two paths to God. One is that you're a child of God. You're created in the image of God. Every person is. And there are universal laws. There are about a hundred of them that fall into seven categories of laws that are generally referred to as the seven Noahide laws, Okay. And then if you're a Jew, that means you're part of a nation as the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you have incumbent upon you 613 commandments. Now, not all those commandments actually apply to everyone. For instance, many commandments don't apply to women, only men, only blind people, people who are not blind, but there are 613 commandments. So we don't try to convert people who are not Jewish to Judaism because Hashem loves and cares about each and every one of you, and he wants to be close to you. The path for a Jew is to be a light to the nations, and as such, there are more commandments for him or her. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Next super chat is Jason Stewart. Scholars like to attack Jeremiah as having a failed 70-year prophecy and Daniel fixing it, but having failed and having incorrect facts. Thoughts, Rabbi? Yeah, but th that's a great question, and there's, that has to be done properly. So the answer is no. Let me explain, okay? Everybody, everybody sit tight here. Jeremiah has two very important prophecies, Jeremiah 25, verse 12, and 29, verse 10. And if you read them side by side, if you want to open your Bibles or open your browser, go ahead. Jeremiah 25, 12 and Jeremiah 29, 10 speak of a 70-year period and speak about a Babylonian empire that would come to an end. 29, 10, however, refers to the Jewish people returning back to the land. Daniel in chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, is cracking his head over these two passages. Why? And it says in the text, he was trying to make sense of this calculation. Daniel presumed that Jeremiah, so just so you know, little history, Jeremiah lived before the destruction of the first temple and during the destruction of the first temple. Daniel lived during the Babylonian exile, during that 70-year period, okay? So uh, they were technically contemporaries, but Daniel was very, very young. He was only 14 years old when he was brought to Nebuchadnezzar's palace. So they're, they're almost contemporary. The Jeremiah is older, okay? Got it? Good. Okay. Daniel thinks that these two prophecies are the same. And let me, let's chart out what they are. The, the destruction of the Babylonian Empire following 70 years, and the Jews would then return back to their land, would be restored back to the land after 70 years, and he thinks they're all the same. You must know a piece of history in order to understand the force of this. So everybody sit back, listen very carefully. You won't get any of it. The Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, rose to power 19 years, almost two decades before the first temple was destroyed. The very next year, the following year, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, I think they call him in the Anglo anglicized version, invades Jerusalem a year after becoming the king of the superpower. He then subjugates 
Israel, Jerusalem, and Israel then becomes a vassal state, but not willingly, and the Jews are fighting back. They want no part of this. They don't want to be a vassal state. There will be a series of exiles during that time, very one, 11 years before the destruction of the first temple. The point that you that you've got to wrap your head around is that the the Babylonian subjugation of Jerusalem begins not when the first temple is destroyed. This is where everyone gets it wrong. Rather, nearly two decades earlier. Listen very carefully. What happens 50 years after the destruction of the first temple? This is very critical. So if, you're not, if you, don't, you don't know history, all my words are going to be out there. But if you know it, this is going to go, wow. It's going to, okay. So what happens 50 years after the destruction of the first temple? Who becomes king? Cyrus. What happens? The Persian Empire merges. What happens to the Babylonian Empire? Like that, it's gone. Historians to, to, to this day are pressed and cannot fully explain how that could possibly happen. A world superpower collapsed, and in a moment, you have the emergence of the Persian Empire. Now, Daniel's, excuse me, Jeremiah's first prophecy, look at Jeremiah 25, verse 12, is that the Babylonian Empire would last for 70 years. The context of Jeremiah chapter 25 is the following. Stop rebelling against Babylon. God's not on your side. Incidentally, that's the major theme of the book of Jeremiah. It's not the only thing, but this is the big one. Do not rebel against Babylon. I know they took control of the country, but God is not with you. He doesn't like the way you're behaving, and don't rebel. And if you do, you're going to get in trouble. And then he goes, guys, just get around, listen carefully. By the way, I have inside information. Babylon only has 70 years. That means if you just shut up and stop fighting them, they're going to be gone anyway. The Jews don't listen to Jeremiah, as you could figure it out. And, you know, when Rembrandt paints Jeremiah as one who's just very sad and upset, there's a reason for it, okay? Je Jeremiah 29 verse 10 is a different prophecy. It's not a prophecy telling us of the Babylonian Empire's beginning and end, but rather from the period of the destruction of the first temple, the destruction of the second temple would be 70 years. Daniel conflates those two periods in the angel and Christ to God, because what does Daniel think? I've got to do this. What does Daniel think? You don't need to ask Rabbi Singer this. Read Daniel 9 verse 1. Darius the Mede in the first year of Darius the Mede. Why is that relevant? If Darius the Mede, this very temporary period, emerges, that means the Babylonian Empire has ended. That means Jeremiah 25 verse 12 has been fulfilled, but Jeremiah 29 verse 10 has not been fulfilled. And Daniel thinks the worst. Keep reading. Daniel thinks that, my gosh, the curse of Leviticus 26 verse 18 has been fulfilled, meaning that I'll multiply your punishment 77 times, which means instead of a 70-year exile, perhaps, heaven forbid, there's a 490-year exile. And that's why he starts praying, and then Gabriel comes in and answers him, and the Christians make a hay over this. So it's their two prophecies of 70 years. They overlap by 50 years, and that's the solution, which Daniel discovers in a prophecy from the angel Gabriel in the ninth chapter of Daniel. It's really beautiful. It's so exquisite. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi. You know you do it to yourself, right? Uh, well, what you, would I, what should I do differently? What? You, so what? We're doing a two-hour and No, it's only show. two in the morning where you're at. It's only no, it's, two in the morning. I mean, if you want to keep going. Hey, no, I do want to try and get through these. And um, and everybody, if you don't, if you want to support the channel, you can. But no more questions, please. I really Is there a song, it's two o'clock in the morning? Damn it, listen to me good. I'm sleeping with myself tonight. <laughs> There is a song by Elton John. It, it like that, isn't it? Is it right now. is it two o'clock in the morning in the Elton John song? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, someone asks uh, the Aquarius someone saved my life tonight. Yeah. Okay. Someone asks, will you debate Adam Green of No More News and that Christianity is a Jewish psyop? So the the idea is that um, Christianity was like created by Jews to kind of trick Gentiles into coming in. I don't know something to the effect of coming in to worship the God of Abraham. But would you debate Adam Green? Do you know? No, who I, I don't know. I don't know who he is, and no, 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 I don't know who he is. But that is a, you know, that is, I, I don't know him. 
I don't know him. So I don't know you, Adam Green. So I'm this is not against you. I don't know who you are. And I'm a rabbi. I'm not a um I'm 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 not someone who just like the puppet people put on stage and I just debate people because I feel like having intellectual discourses. I'm my motivation is religious and Jews who are in the church, I want you to come home. So no Jews believe that, so therefore it's irrelevant to me. I mean, I I'd like it if I would love it if people think nice things about Jews, but that's just not an issue that comes up, okay? Um, there is an idea. I don't know if there's Adam Greens or whatever, but there is an idea out there by people who are not fond of the Jewish people, <laughs> who, who, who are so unfond of us that think that Christianity is like the worst thing in the world, and the Jews wanted to do it to the Gentiles, so we invented Christianity in order to like give it to them, like mm -hmm. create this this disgusting, grotesque, murderous religion, you know, whatever. I mean, does that even require an answer? I don't know who Adam, Adam Green, I'm sure you're just misunderstood, whoever you are. I don't know who you are, whatever. But I've heard that coming from like uh, anti-Christian uh, neo-Nazis, clans, kind of that kind of stuff in That's from true. hate groups. I've heard that. Yes, I have no idea who that is, and neither do I want to know. If someone has that feeling and that idea, um, so obviously there's a lot of darkness in that heart. It, 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 there's a lot of, it, that's a dark heart, to think that we would come up with something like that. that would, but um, I, my heart goes out to people who, who, whose minds are filled with such thoughts. So. Well, thank you. Sentinel Apologetics. Thank you. Oh, Rob, <laughs> I'm, I'm moving along. Rob Why? Rose. Why? Okay, go ahead. Rob we'll Rowe, thank one. you. I call him Rob Lowe sometimes on accident, but it's a compliment. Um, this is referring back to the judges thing. If she wasn't killed, then why does Philo say, then all the virgins of Israel gathered together and buried the daughter of Jephthah and wept for her? Why wouldn't he say that? I mean... That's actually the way the text reads. So why wouldn't he say that? I mean, I mean, this is like you talk about pathos. Here's this girl who never tasted love, who'd never been kissed in her life by a man that she adored. Every dream she had of one day falling in love and one day building a family with someone that she adores was destroyed. So imagine for a moment. Now here she is condemned um, to either die a virgin, our tradition, or she's killed on top of a mountain. If you look carefully at the text, you have to look carefully, you'll see. But it doesn't make a difference because that's not the point. So, man, like, think about this girl, right? Young girl. She has all her friends. What do, what do young girls talk about? Young girls sit together and think about the man they think is gorgeous, the man that they want, the man they hope. And they are all hoping one day to enjoy the, the, the gift of intimacy, to kiss the man that they love, right? And imagine how her contemporaries would feel at this tragedy that this dream would never be fulfilled. Like, why is that, why is that hard to understand? And then... The book of Judges is there to italicize mistakes, loads of them, loads of them. Take my word for it, just loaded with really bad events. It's not there telling telling us about bad events saying, and you should therefore do it. It's like, you know, there's a guy, you know, you know, snorting crack while he's drinking a martini. It's like, don't do that. It's all the things you're not supposed to do. And as I said earlier, Judges is there as a introduction to the book of Samuel. That's the real reason it's there. So why? I mean, could you not see all of her friends who too were virgins, but the hope, the dream they had would one day be fulfilled, but their friend that they loved so much, she would never enjoy the bliss of love, marriage, and bearing children? I mean, of course. Philo, incidentally, is not an Orthodox Jew. He's an Hellenized Jew. So his views are not orthodox. It's not that he's like, he's what's called heterodox. Um, but he's not like far off insane, you know, 
but um, so no religious Jew takes Philo seriously. A religious Jew who's interested in history is very curious about Philo because here's a Jew who lived, was born in 20 BC, I guess died in the 50s, so curious about the period, but theologically he's not relevant to us. He's relevant to, the, to historians and things like of that sort. It relates to Christianity because why didn't Philo, who's a contemporary of Jesus and Paul, like why didn't Philo mention this? But that's, he's a, a Jew from North Africa. Is of, his views were not... Uh, we're not mainstream, we're not the consensus. Anyways, my friend, my dear friend, I thank you very much. Yes, uh, Kylan says, how did you see Josephus? Is he reliable? Is Josephus, now, I mean, briefly, because you could go on and on about this, but what are your what are your? There's no brieflies, you can't do that. I, I you mean, have to. You, you can't, have to. you're not asking me how much is two plus two. You're asking me a very interesting question. So yeah, why, I know, you, there's a whole why are your viewers episode. dumb down the questions and ask me, like, how many books are there in the Torah? And you'll get your fast answer. But they, if you ask me, what did you think about Josephus? You're not going <laughs> to get that. So, you know, if you ask me how many books are in the prophetic section, I'll give you the number. You know, how many chapters are there in the book of Isaiah? Fine. How many chapters in the book of Psalms? Fine, but don't ask me a question like, what did you then think? Then tell us. Okay, then. I'm not going to argue. So stop it. So dumb down your audience. Okay? I can't. And we can do that. I can't dumb okay. them down. They're too small. All right. Us, they so. are. Anyway, okay. You actually have a very sophisticated audience. So, uh, Josephus, I'll, I'll, it, it is often asked. I sometimes give tours of Israel. Uh, I don't do it often, but very occasionally. So, people ask, like, do we know where Josephus is buried? So the answer is we don't. And I usually say it's good that we don't know because if the Jews would have found out, they would have dug up his body and thrown his bones out of the grave. Josephus was hated by the Jews because he was seen as a traitor of the Jewish people. He was the, the very person that became employed by the Roman Empire that oversaw the destruction of the temple. So he's despised as a traitor to the people of Israel. So as, as, now... We're not living 2,000 years ago, so people get detached from that. But I need to tell you, the viewers, something about Jews. We don't forget and we don't forgive. Okay. So that's the feeling of the Jews about Josephus. One other point might be said. Religious Jews don't walk around thinking about Josephus. He's not, he's not important to us. Unless Josephus brings us something that has historical significance, we don't like him. We, don't, we, we take him seriously— on certain matters, because Joseph was writing for Kim Jong-un. If you are the historian for Kim Jong-un, like how seriously would you take that person? Well, if it wouldn't get Joseph in trouble, then and it wasn't relevant to the empire, then sure. But whenever it relates to what happened in Masada, where he's our chief, chief source for Masada, I mean, almost everything we know about Masada comes from two sources, Josephus and archaeology. So, you know, but we take it with a grain of salt because who is he writing for? He's writing for the empire. So every historian, the serious historian, takes Josephus um, – very carefully because we know the bias that he had, who he was working for. He wasn't like writing for the prime minister of Canada. <laughs> He's not writing for some free, you know, open country where you can write whatever you want. No. So he's, he's employed by the empire to destroy the temple. So we don't like him. And he's historically extremely valuable, extremely valuable. But whenever there's an issue to how the Jews behaved that would make them look bad vis-a-vis -vis the Romans, that we take with not a grain of salt, not a pail of salt, but with a ton of salt. Because we know that he would write things that would portray the Jews in a light that was uncharitable vis-a-vis -vis the empire. And that's why I selected the events of Masada that culminated in 73 very carefully. It's that that we take it because we, and we know, we know Joseph has made stuff up. And I don't, I don't think he was ever actually at Masada as he, but he definitely wanted to portray the, the, the rebels at Masada in a way that, uh, 
that it was comported with the way the Romans would want it to be portrayed. One other footnote, and I'll stop. That is, to religious Jews, the events of Masada is not considered heroic at all. It's considered a nightmare. Suicide is forbidden in Judaism, and they should have never done that. And that may come as news to you. Religious Jews, just religious Jews, do not look at the events in Masada that culminated in 73, because the second time was destroyed in 70, but the war kept going because Masada was a, a fortress built by Herod century earlier. Herod never used it, but it served as a, as a, as a very good uh, fortress where the Jews were able to survive for quite a few years. So we take, we take everything he says with, with realizing the, how it's deeply colored. And I'm taking a very extreme event to convey a, a complex topic. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Sentinel okay, my friend, it's 1.25 in the morning. You can't blame me. You can't. Why? I, I, can. I, I can. I told you, you we have some questions. I always mean, blame the guy. When you have no choice, you okay. have to go for. I have to go for the guy. What am I going to do? I, I don't blame All you. Right. So let's. Uh, we have stopped everyone from asking any more questions. Just getting through the ones we have. So if there's something you think you don't have to spend too much time on, go. Go for it. Sentinel Apologetics. If Daniel nine isn't about Messiah, then why did the Essenes calculate the date of his arrival between four BC and two AD? See Roger Beckwith on Qumran. Just read that one time. Why did the Essenes date? What? They calculate the date of his ar his arrival between four BC and two AD. I don't believe that, and I, I never saw that in my life, and I don't know. Well, let me, I retract that. I had never heard of that in my life, so I'm not qualified to answer that question. I don't, I don't believe that because I would have heard of that. I'm not saying I heard of everything, but that just sounds a little ridiculous. Now, that said, the Assyrians were, we, we don't know a lot about them, and if there were no Dead Sea Scrolls if what occurred whatever, 75 years ago or so ago, whatever, if if a Bedouin didn't find, no one would ever think about Assyrians. But from what we know about Assyrians, they were an apocalyptic group that thought the end of the world was coming, and they were there, if they were the people in the Dead Sea, in the Qumran area, which is the consensus, they were the kind of group that was always thinking the end of the world was coming imminently. So, like, that's in their writings, a considerable part of their writings that left was left over that survived in their library, the Qumran community was destroyed in 68 by the Romans. But I don't, how do you date 4 BC? 4 BC is the year that Herod the Great died. Like, how do you, like, how do you, on what basis do you date that? I'm not saying I know, like, I, my whole life studying a C is, but like, 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 where do you even come up with 4 BC? Like, the whole concept of 4 BC would have come from Danaseus Exiguus, but whatever. Like they thought that the Messiah would come when Herod the Great died. I don't know. So what? I don't know. It doesn't. Um, yeah. yeah. Charles so. Wilcox, I'm pushing us. Rabbi, back to conversion. Levit uh, Leviticus 27, the vow, Noahide oath, question mark, seven laws, not all 613 mishva for converts, or is this a different level of conversion? Right. So, um, okay. So uh, Judaism is different than any other religion in that we're an ethno-religious group. You can join our faith without joining our people, right? And then you would observe the seven Noahide laws, which are really seven categories of laws that, are, uh, that really amount to a little less than 100 commandments. Um, that's incumbent upon any person who wants to connect to the Jewish faith. If you are, if you join the nation of Israel, there's a process to do that. Then you accept upon yourself all the commandments that are outlined in the Torah. Job, traditionally the oldest book in the Torah, in the Jewish scriptures, was a Noahide. He didn't keep Sabbath, didn't keep kosher. There's no mention of those things because he was a Noahide. He accepted the Jewish faith without joining the Jewish nation. Okay. There's your answer. Thank you so much. So there are two paths here. You can do it. You can actually do it. I'm shocked. I didn't know it was in you. 
Um, You're going to get it after the show. (laughs) You're paying. And I'm going to speak to the queen after the show. This is not done. Oh, please don't. Now we're serious. This is serious. Please don't. Um, Rabbi uh, Toby Singer, and thank you, Eric, from uh, Peru. Rabbi Toby Singer, do you consider that Paul thought he was writing his letters to lost Israelites of the northern kingdom dispersed among the nations? For example, Romans 9, he applied. Yeah, no, 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 stop, stop. Paul is a, is a scam. Romans is a scam. Paul lied and he got away with it. And he got away with it because he was speaking to people who knew nothing about the faith he was asking them to abandon. He was speaking to former pagans. And he was saying to them in Romans 9.25 that a, there's a promise in the book of Hosea, chapter 2, that those who are not my people will be called my people. Listen carefully. Okay, That's a scam. Paul lied to them. The people who should be angry at Paul are Christians. Mm. And Muslim. Muslims really hate Paul and they're right for hating Paul. They hate Paul a lot because they believe that Jesus was a prophet. They believe that Paul messed it all up. And they're right for hating Paul. But let's get back here. This is this is grotesque. And Hosea lived 2,700 years ago during the Assyrian Empire, contemporary of Isaiah. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, which was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. Hosea marries a prostitute by orders of God, and he has children who are given names. One of them is Lo-Ami, you're not my people. His child is named that. Prophets were given children in order to name their children names that would portent doom or success. Isaiah, Hosea, complete contrast. The key is that while Hosea chapter 1 says, you guys of what we would call the ten northern tribes are finished, okay, and you're no longer my people, this is very much a theme in the prophets where God is full of rage through his prophets, but then God comes back and says, look, there is hope. You know, it's like someone smoking, that's going to kill you. But when we say that's going to kill you, we don't want you to die, and there's hope because if you just stop smoking, your lungs will repair themselves. Okay, so... Hosea then says about the 10 northern tribes we just excoriated, he says to them, but those who are not your people, they'll be called my people, which means you're going to be re- 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 you'll be restored. Those who are low rachamu, who I, won't come, you'll ultimately be comforted. Those who are seated will ultimately be seated. That's the theme. My friends, you know, this is like the Bible I'm quoting. Like everyone has access to it. I shouldn't be the one here. Everyone should be reading this. So it is speaking about the restoration of the lost tribes, the 10 northern tribes, in context. Paul in Romans 9 is applying that to non-Jews. That's a complete misappropriation of the text. Paul is saying that, I mean, the, what is Pauline is this theme, and it's not, it's all over, and that is that ultimately the covenant that was made with the Jews has been now given as a universal covenant of faith to all the world. Sounds nice, but it's really grotesque, because he he eviscerates this, the gorgeous messages found in Tanakh, and that's where he does it in Romans 9.25, completely misquotes it. So Paul desecrated the Jewish scriptures that he, he promised to uphold, but desecrated to who? Jews didn't fall for that line, but the non-Jews, what chance do they have? Jews and Gentiles in Rome were getting, receiving a letter like that? They had no chance of figuring that one out. So Paul was a charlatan. End of story. Thank you so much, Rabbi. <laughs> and that was a blast. We, we, only, have, we only have a no, few. No. Yeah, that was a wonderful what? way to end uh, that that statement. He was a charlatan. Enough said. He was. It was a complete. He was really charlatan. And he got away with it. Matthew didn't get away with it. The Jews, who were Matthew's intended audience, didn't buy it because of Matthew. Matthew saved the Jewish people in a crazy way, but Paul got away with it because he was a minister to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles there was no way they could determine the difference between chaff and wheat, and he got away with the scam. Do you believe that Gnosticism is the original form of Christianity, and did Christianity only emerge as an extension to or of Enochian tradition? So I believe that Gnosticism was the traction, was the pervasive theology. Now, I want to just be very clear. I want to 
take the word Gnosticism out, because that gets tricky, of when did Gnosticism begin? And it really would mess everything if we do that. So, And this is where everyone gets in trouble. Gnostics didn't begin until the second century. Stop that. That's it's, it's We have to be very clear. The, the dualistic idea, that's the hallmark of Gnosticism. And that means that's the problem that Gnosticism seeks to... To, to heal. Gnosticism seeks to bring about salvation through knowledge, hence Gnosticism. But Gnostics saw the world as a world that was, that, that was, that there were all sorts of forces, independent forces that were at war with each other. This is very ancient. This is the undergirding of Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism, a, a Persian religion. And the only thing, good thing I could say about it is, is that Freddie Mercury was a member of it. But so the I, so I'm going to reframe it. The undergirding theology of Gnosticism was a necessary component to creating Christianity, which took a thumbnail of Judaism and 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 then inserted the idolatry of dualism, which is the central feature of Gnosticism, and that was essential to explain why do you need Jesus. That means if there are forces in the world that are so powerful and so dark, then you, my friends, have no power to overcome them. There's no initiative that you have to defeat Satan. You can't. Even though Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, in context, God says to Cain, that sin is lying behind, hiding behind the door. You are the object of its desire, but you can master over him. I mean, it's the, this is why Jews find Christianity grotesque. So that must be in there. So therefore, we have to just we have to reduce the these um, these fractions and decimals down to a, 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 a numbers that we can really easily work with. It's almost, so what we do is we let's not say Gnosticism, let's say dualism. And dualism was the central component because if there really is an independent, um, malnevolent power in the world that is an enemy of the good powers in the world, then you are not powerful enough to overcome it because in the Persian mind, in the Greek mind, in the Roman mind, the celestial and terrestrial were completely utterly incompatible. And you had no, I mean, think about what, how did people think 2,000 years ago? You looked at the sky, you saw the stars, you could predict where the planets and the, where the celestial bodies would be, and they moved with precision. And you looked around you, and you saw broken wagons and dead siblings and people who were sick for reasons that were unknown earthquakes that were inexplicable and volcanoes that terrorized societies and and you wondered like the gods must be at war with each other Judaism was saying no it's all all from God there's only one force Gnosticism said these are powers that are way too great for you and you had the secret knowledge then you'd be able to get yourself away from this evil wretched world that was the idea of Gnosticism Gnosticism is the same ideas that you'll find in in um, what's his name? <laughs> Been on so long. The second century Christian thing. Marcion. Marcion. Same undergirding thing. I write about this in volume one. Let's get people. Marcion. I said this world is a wretched world, a dirty world. This idea is thoroughly Christian. You know when Paul brags about his being a virgin, encouraging other virgins to remain celibate like him. I mean, this is what Gal got Galileo thrown in prison. Because he said that the terrestrial and the celestial were compatible, actually functioned with each other, and that you can send something into orbit if it was if it was if it was launched at a high enough velocity. This was the church. This is impossible. The terrestrial world is filled with sin, and church fathers encourage people who were married that you know if you're gonna live together, sure you know be take care of your husband, your wife. You find that course in in the letters of Paul but once you've made the number of children that you need to bring to this world then there's no reason for you to have intimacy any longer I mean this was I mean the celibacy the Catholic Church can't be blamed for this one they didn't pull us out of the sky this is all dualistic idea that physical pleasure and the physical world was utterly incompatible with the spiritual world. Judaism had a completely different message. It was unique. And that is they're all connected. The most ecstatic dream 
in the Torah is the one that Jacob envisioned, a ladder connecting the heaven and earth. Joseph's genes were incomplete. Stars in the sky, heavenly bodies, as opposed to shears of hay, of, of wheat on the ground, not connected. Judaism says, of course, have an intimate relationship with your wife. Eat something, make a blessing, raise it up to God. Bring an offering, raise it up to Hashem. Every act in your life, raise it up to God. Connect the celestial and the terrestrial. The Greek world wanted no part of it. And you see where Paul was coming from and how non pharisee he was. Because 1 Corinthians 15, I need not say more. You know, Paul is claiming that the resurrected Jesus' body is a, is a spiritual body. Where do you think that comes from? That's all that undergirding. This world is dirty. This whole wretched body of mine. I mean, Romans 7. The, Paul is thoroughly Greek in his thinking. Now, it doesn't mean he didn't have access to Judaism. Everybody does. But, you know, if you were knowledgeable, you had knowledge about the only monotheism. Like today, Jews have competition. I'm being cute. But the, we you, we have competition. There are other um, Abrahamic monotheisms in the world. Then there was none. There was us and nothing else. We were the only game in town. So, yes. So the undergirding of Gnosticism is the undergirding of Christianity. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Two more here. Sadat, thank you, said, you just can't trust the Christian interpretation if you're trying to learn about the Abrahamic God. Remember the virgin birth. And I think that's just a comment. So thank you for the comment. Appreciate the super chat. We have another super chat here that said, uh, Sentinel Apologetics, just put laugh out loud. And thank you for the super chat. Also, a final one was right down here at the bottom at the lowest uh, celestial plane, which is terrestrial. And uh, I'm just teasing. Um, Mr. Morpheus says, Jews say they are Yahweh's chosen. Chosen for what? Special how? And who is the God of the other people if he is the Jews God? Yeah. Jews are chosen. Final question. This is it. This is it. I was lecturing in Nashville, Tennessee, synagogue called the West End Synagogue. After my lecture... An Assemblies of God minister came over and introduced himself to me. He wasn't completely happy with my lecture. And he asked me, you Jews think you're chosen, don't you? And he, he just wasn't happy with me. I kind of picked that up. Uh, I asked him, like, where in Jewish literature do we first encounter such an idea? And he stopped, paused, and he said, the Bible. I said, then who are you complaining to? Okay. That pretty much squares it up. The Jews are chosen, yes, but chosen for what? We're chosen for wealth, for security in our possessions, to control the world? No. We were chosen to be a light to the nations, to have a relationship with God, and through that relationship bring light to the world, to change them in a world that would be forever, forever augmented and bring the world closer to God. How? by serving Hashem, being loyal to him and loving him, having a personal relationship with him. And as such, we bring light to the world. That's why we're also called God's firstborn, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. When the Jews carry out their mandate, it brings light to the world. Imagine a room with no windows, no opening, no aperture, completely dark. Kindle one light. And the light reaches every part of the room. The Jews have the ability to bring light to the world. And conversely, if a Jew turns his back on God, he can bring darkness to the world in a way that no one else can. Jews have this ability, I submit, to, yes, to lead anything. We can produce pro prophets and we can produce Madoffs. We produce it all. It's, it's a power. And now the question is, what is the Jew going to choose? Now, when the Jew is loyal to God, so then we raise up the world. We are a mamleches kohan of a goy kadosh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation for this purpose. If, on the, on the other hand, the Jewish people turn away from their mandate and don't keep the Torah, as Paul urges us repeatedly not to keep it, and turn away from God, what does that do to the world? It diminishes the light from the world. It turns the non-Jews away from the Almighty. Now, if non-Jews are turned away from God, how do they express their rage at the Creator?
Master, you can't very much flail your fists at heaven. Pointless. So in turn, what the non-Jew does is act out violence against the Jews. I lived in Indonesia five years. Right now, take my word for it, it's the fourth largest country in the world, and it's it's situated in the, in the circle of fire. Um, earthquakes were routine. Um, people suffered from a lot of, it's a beautiful place, but it's a place of a lot of natural disasters. That whole region is. But Jews, typically, we don't suffer from natural disasters. Central South America suffers from all sorts of not Jews, not really. Thailand, Aceh, Indonesia, hit by a tsunami, not Jews. Jews, we all know the deal. Whether you're a believer or not, you know the Jewish people have suffered consistently throughout our history. We don't have a monopoly on it, but it's very striking. And who do we suffer from? Non-Jews. Why? It's actually a, a perfect systems theory borrowing a term in that when the it's it's measure for measure when the jew turns his back on the god of israel we diminish the light in the world which then robs the non-jew from his connection with the almighty what does he do in, in instead he then attacks god's first born son israel and that should wake the jew up to say you need to turn back to torah you need to turn back to the god of abraham isaac and jacob thank you Thank you so much, Rabbi. I uh, must bring on our friend who's been waiting down in the chat, Neil Nasik, informant. The 473 people watching, there's an interview he did with Rabbi, and you guys, right after this, go check it out. What What do you want to say, Neil? I'm 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 going to drop it tomorrow because you just had him on for three hours. I mean, let's let's give the people some time to 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 have you know watch some TV for a little bit or something. You know what I mean? I'm going to drop that tomorrow. Uh, you but want I would tease him. Yeah, I do want to say this. Before you show that teaser, I want to show something real quick. And I know Rebecca's got to go. So this is a coin right no, here. It's okay. It's all good. This is a coin. But Derek, that... I got to go. For you, I'll stay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> you see this coin? Is it? Is it? Back it up a little bit or? Yeah, there it is. It's focused somewhat. Yeah. What is that? Donald Trump and Cyrus. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. It's so called, It's called the temple coin. I don't know. If... Oh, wow. That's I weird. I think it's like the Zionist Christians love this. Like this is what they made. Right. 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 But they're recognizing that Cyrus was a non-Jewish Messiah, and they're saying Trump could be like that too. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem because he was number forty-five. Exactly. Remember yeah. when I told you that? Really now, the point is not. Isn't that isn't that just crazy? I mean, isn't yeah, that insane? It is crazy. Like people must think watching me that like the things that I express are so fantastic and ridiculous that surely I must be like mischaracterizing this to in order to make a point, and I'm not. Like none of this is a conspiracy theory. That's right. That, that, that's the Cyrus. Cyrus is the one that gives the command for the Jews to return and build Jerusalem. Exactly. And the Christians who believe that it wasn't an accident that Trump was president number forty-five who gives the order for the embassy to move to Jerusalem. Right, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. But but as another thing I got from my because a lot of a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of people do know also that I'm a recent deconverted Christian for, within the last couple of years. So within Trump's term, I was still going to church, and we would pass out stuff like this. These are Jewish New Testament, and the reason why I bring that up is because Rabbi and I did a show that I that I'm editing. It's going to be done tomorrow morning, where he he makes a claim that, like for example, when when somebody commits a crime. They cover up their crime with, like, for example, they bleach the gun or something. So uh, uh, somebody, like a, a detective, showed up at the house. Why do you have your gun in a, in a tub of bleach? What, what's going on here? What are you trying to cover up? Well, the reason why I bring that up is because this book right here is a living example of a gun sitting in bleach. And I'll, I'm going to demonstrate that to you in the video. I'm not going to talk about that now because I don't want to blow it away. But I do have a teaser that Derek has ready to go, and we'll end on this. For so just like people who save Jews from the Nazis had to lie to the Nazis, like Corey Ten Boom. So they did that in order to protect us. So the Jews took the character Jesus, who really is the Jesus of the first century, and then shoved him to the first century BCE and the second century. Not for any theological reason, just to make sure that Jewish communities would not be killed by the church. It did not work very well, I should say. It was, I mean, the church didn't buy it. And a, I many say, Jews how emerged. Can two Jesus of Nazareth both being killed for leading Israel astray and both have a mother named Mary? 
It gets more. Do you want more, or do you want me to go? You want? Do you want? To, you want me to give you something? But every other show is going to be jealous that I'm giving you this hot, hot stuff. Okay. Fifty bucks for this one. <laughs> okay, I want you to listen very carefully. This is hot. This is pure heat. As it turns out. That's all you get. <laughs> you suck. That's no, all you, you did it. You better subscribe to Gnostic Informant and you'll see that video tomorrow. That's awesome. Thank you, Rabbi, for your time and, and having to put up with these kitam, or if I will, goyim, whatever you want to call me. I appreciate your patience. Wow. Thank you very much again. That's it. That's the shortest answer all night. It comes down to the closing statement. <laughs> Go get some sleep. I love you. Lila Tov, sweetheart. Love you. All right. Um, Rabbi's off to bed, everybody. And uh, I'm going to give us an outro here. Uh, I love everybody. I hope you guys hit the like button. Uh, email me if you have any questions. And uh, until next time, I look forward to hearing from my favorite rabbi, Tovia Singer. Here's my little intro. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.